All right. Looks like we are going. Ten concurrent viewers. Check, check, check. Okay, good. Pickup is working. If anyone has any technical difficulties, like for example, if I'm talking too loud or the mic pickup is too, like if it's getting garbled or anything like that, let me, so check, 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 check. Okay, just turn the mic down a little. That seems to work. Okay, cool. Close the window, ready to go. Nine concurrent, ten concurrent. Ooh, all right. Somehow, here we go. Okay, so for those of you who are logged in and uh, streaming and ready to go, I appreciate uh, you being here. Um, there's going to be an opportunity for you to respond to some questions throughout this, uh, either in the comments or via email, um, and that is going to allow me to determine that you are, in fact, present. Um, it'll be my mechanism for taking role. Um, some of you have already indicated some issues. Uh, well, I guess you wouldn't be listening to this right now live, but for those of you who are uh, listening to this after it's been posted, hello, Anahi, good to, good to see you. Um, Good to see your avatar anyway. Um, the um, You are uh, excused, those of you who have already contacted me uh, and let me know that um, you've lost childcare or something else has come up. Um, so thank you for being in touch. Uh, and let me see, 13, we're getting up there. Um, I'm going to let this... Hello, Hector. Uh, I'm going to let this get... Um, get this uh, warmed up a little bit. I'll let people kind of log on. I recognize that, um, you know, 15, nice, that it may be, uh, maybe a little bit um, for some folks to kind of figure out. Uh, they might be opening their email for the first time. Okay, cool. Great. It looks, yeah, so there's definitely a lag um, between when I, uh, when I say something and um, when you hear it. Um, and then when I see comments, um, I don't know how long the lag is necessarily. Um, Jimmy, good to see you. Reed, Connor, Stephanie, Jennifer, Max, awesome. Thank you all um, for, for being here uh, during these interesting uh, and difficult times. So I'm going to have my uh, email um, open through this whole thing. I'm going to have uh, the comments open through the whole thing, so I'll be able to see uh, comments that are occurring on the stream, and I'll also be able to periodically check over into my email if anything comes up that you need to communicate uh, with me there. Um, if you're not, you know, if you don't have like a YouTube account or whatever, um, then you can just send me an email, uh, and that will, that will be sufficient. Okay. Quit that email application. Quit that application. All right. So I think what's probably, CC, good to see you. Hello. Uh, I think what's probably at the top of people's minds, um, at least with respect to the class, I covered some of this um, in the test stream that should also be available on this channel. Uh, I decided not to delete it because it actually contains some information that I'm going to go over now, but is also relevant for you um, if you'd like to like to see it um, with respect to the syllabus, the exam, the group project in particular, which again I'm going to go over right now, but um, if you've already seen that, uh, if you were participating in that stream, um, or if you if you watched the video uh, afterwards, thank you for, for that, um, and this will be a little bit of a rehash, uh, but nonetheless I think it's obviously important for me to do this for everybody else's benefit. Um, I'm going to give about another minute or so just so that we've, you know, given people a little bit more time, uh, 635. Marian, good to see you, good to see you. Um, <clears throat> 635 before I really kick this, kick this off. Uh, there will be breaks, right? So we're still going to break um, at particular points in lecture, uh, and that's going to allow, um, <clears throat> that's obviously going to allow us to uh, rest our minds, rest our eyes, 
uh, get up and walk around and what have you. Um, so that will, that will still occur. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to have the uh, guest lecture that I was going to have for today's content on water quality. Um, Maurice Washington, uh, Dr. Maurice Washington, um, from, from my regular job, uh, is not, is not going to be available today. Um, but I'm, uh, I, I assure you that I, I'm, I'm sad because I haven't seen, uh, him give, give a talk before. So I was hoping to get to see it. Okay. 635. We're going to go, we're going to roll. Um, so this is the preamble to the exam, what you're seeing here in the middle of your screen. Um, and by the way, it makes sense, like, I think conceptually for you to, um, full, uh, full screen your full screen, this stream, um, you got a sneak peek at the first question. Um, <clears throat> that's going to help make everything be big enough for you to read, uh, and see the details of. Um, so <clears throat> basically here, uh, you can see that I'm really emphasizing since you're not handing this in in person, please, um, please, please make sure that you put your name on, on the exam. Um, don't, don't just send it to me in an email, uh, without a name on it and assume that because you emailed it to me, I'm going to be uh, able to determine whose it was. Um, don't trust me that much. Put your name on it. <laughs> um, put your name on the actual thing that you sent me. Don't just, uh, don't just assume that because I got it in an email, uh, I'll be able to trace back and identify who, uh, who submitted it. Um, so the exam is open book, quote unquote, which basically means literally open book and open everything. So you're welcome to use the internet. You're welcome to use any of the lectures that have been posted. You're welcome to use any and all resources that are available to you other than other human beings. Um, so that's obviously not something that I can enforce in person, um, but it is an expectation. Um, and you know, we'll be going off the honor system on that. So, uh, please, please keep your work to yourself. Uh, each question is going to be worth four points. Uh, the exam is worth 60 points total. So there's 15 questions. Um, if you have any questions about the exam, you're, you're welcome to email me. Um, and the exam is due via email to me before the beginning of next class. So next Tuesday, 6.29 p.m., um, please, please send your, uh, your email um, with your exam. That would be preferred. Um, you can either fill in your answers, like this is going to be posted to uh, Canvas. Um, this exam will be posted to Canvas after this lecture, um, so tonight at 9.30. Um, and basically it's, it's a word document. So you're welcome to fill in your answers directly below, um, by typing them, or, um, you can, if you have access to a printer, you can print, um, <clears throat> the exam, uh, and, and, or just answer the questions. Um, you don't even necessarily have to print the exam. You can just, um, have a piece of paper and answer the questions on the piece of paper, number them, put your name on it. Um, and then either take, you know, high quality photos, uh, of the, of the exam that you completed and send it to me, um, or scan it if you have access to a scanner. Um, so those are, those are the ways that at least off the top of my head, I can think of that you would submit this exam. Um, if you have any other ideas and want to run them by me, uh, by all means, send me an email, ask, and, um, and I'm sure I'll be willing to, willing to accommodate. Okay. So that's the exam. Like I said, that'll be posted tonight on Canvas at 9.30. Um, I'll also email it to you, just so that you have it in both places. Um, let's take a look at the syllabus. Okay, so here is the... No, I don't want to do it exactly like that. That's not exactly how I want to do this. There we go. All right. So make it nice and big for y'all to see it. Um, here's Canvas. Exciting. Wonderful. Awesome. The second exam will be posted here under syllabus and logistics. So this is where you'll see the exam. Um, the two presentations that I'm covering, the end of lecture seven and, and lecture 8.1, that will be uh, today. Um, shortly after today, probably tomorrow or the next day, I will be posting 
lecture 8.2 so that you have it ahead of time. Um, the reading that is going to be assigned at the end of lecture today is this one right here, Hardin 1968. So we've run across Hardin before um, when we talked about lifeboat ethics. Now we're going to be talking about the tragedy of the commons, which, although it deals with population to a certain extent, is also widely applicable to all kinds of other environmental problems, um, as we'll see in the next lecture. Uh... Assignment three. So that assignment is already posted. It's available to you. Um, there are four, I believe, four questions uh, for you to answer with respect to the reading. Yes, there are four questions for you to answer with respect to the reading. And you can uh, submit that uh, electronically as, as before. And also, again, through hard copy. Um, through hard copy. This is not due until the 14th. So I'll, I'll cover these due dates at the end of lecture today, but don't, don't panic. This isn't due the same time as the exam. The exam, um, all you have to do uh, other than the exam, I believe, is, is the reading for the next lecture. Um, but even then, um, we'll, we'll get there. Okay, the next thing is the group assignment. So the group project, um, as I indicated on the test stream, this is now going to be a paper. Um, I apologize for that, but um, just putting together a presentation and then not being able to give the presentation isn't really going to going to cut it. So um, essentially what you're looking at is 1,500 words per person in your groups that you've already established. Um, you don't have to get me the final topic that you're going to do until the 14th, um, which is now updated on the assignment sheet uh, right here, right? So please, um, please make sure that you get that to me uh, on the 14th. Final deliverable is still due via email on the 12th, okay? Um, I would like to see this be a comprehensive document. So although it says 1,500 words per person, really what we're looking at is multiplying 1,500 words by however many people are in your group um, and, and produce a single cohesive document uh, that is of that length or approximately that length. Um, you can go over that length if you'd like, uh, but minimum of approximately that length. Um, so what I don't want to see uh, is a document that is basically three, four, or five, fifteen hundred word essays stapled together, right? Um, uh, about the same topic, different aspects, but not coherent in terms of its narrative. Doesn't flow together. Isn't a a single paper, a single report. Okay. So let me know if you have any questions about that. Um, if you encounter any difficulties, uh, given that you're all going to be working remotely um, and hopefully social distancing and not going over to each other's apartments or houses or whatever, um, please, <laughs> uh, please follow the health order and what have you. Um, but uh, if you're encountering difficulties and this ends up being too much to bite off or take off in the next month uh, or so, um, do let me know and I'm open to scaling it back. Okay, so the syllabus itself um, has been updated with the channel um, where you can find the streams, uh, including this one. Um, everything else is basically unchanged with the exception of this schedule. So what you've got here is the last half of the class. Um, really, this is going to come at us like a fire hose because of where spring break occurred and the fact that we didn't have class last week. So as you can see, we're going to be covering fresh water today with a little bit of uh, biodiversity and conservation uh, thrown in there for spice. And then the exam will be take home. It will cover chapters 8 through 13, and it is due to me again by next class. Next class, we will cover the tragedy of the commons. You don't have to do any reading. So everything that is, it's just the exam. Okay. Um, the next week, we're going to cover energy supplies, um, specifically non-renewable energy. Um, for that, you will, you will still need to do this reading here, uh, 18, 19, and 22. Uh, then your third exam will be issued. Um, here we go. Your third exam will be issued. Um, you'll have a week to complete it. It'll be due the 28th. We're going to cover renewable energy and air pollution. So read chapters 20 and 23 and so on. Um, if you have any questions about how this is going to roll out, please let me know. 
Um, but otherwise, this should be relatively self-explanatory. The one thing that is different here at the end is basically in order for me to have enough time to grade your final project and your exam, um, given that you will take the exam home on the 12th and then turn it into me by the 19th, um, we're not going to have a meeting on the 19th. Uh, there won't be any stream on the 19th. Um, we will say our goodbyes on the 12th. Um, you'll submit your final work. Um, in the form of the take-home exam, which will be cumulative on the 19th. I will grade it, uh, and final grades will, will go out. Okay. If the, again, if there are any questions, you're welcome to put them into the chat. Um, you can also uh, obviously go ahead and um, email those to me when they, when they come up for you. That is a washed out blurry photo uh, from the top of Green Mountain in Colorado, where I went to graduate school. Okay. So if everyone's comfortable with everything that I've just covered, then I'm gonna kick off back into biodiversity just to cover the ground that we already covered uh, a little bit here so that we're all uh, again on on the same page um, okay good good on time so biodiversity bio relating to life right biology the study of living things in life diversity biodiversity diversity being um, a way of recognizing that there are multiple kinds of things that we would put in the same broad category, right? Um, so living things, well, there's different kinds of living things. So biodiversity broadly is an effort to understand the different kinds of living things, um, how many there are, how they're distributed, um, and how it is possible to maintain lots of different living things in the environment. Um, there are multiple different kinds of biodiversity. We talked about genetic diversity, species diversity, and ecological diversity. Um, each of these is important in its own right uh, for maintaining uh, overall species diversity in particular, right? Um, genetic diversity, you can read the slide, essentially has to do with the entire stock of genetic material that's available, all the different mutations that are available um, to be expressed, um, all the different alleles, right? Remember when we would go back to genetics, we talked about alleles, which are different versions of the same gene, so blue eyes, brown eyes, and so forth, curly hair, straight hair, etc. cetera. Um, genetic diversity is the entire stock of, um, of those different alleles that are available um, in the population. And again, a population is a group of individuals of the same species in one place and one time. Um, ecological diversity is the other end of the spectrum, which involves a variety of habitats, niches, trophic levels, and so forth. Essentially, the complexity of the ecosystem, right? Um, the more niches there are in an ecosystem, the more ways for an animal or a plant or a fungi fungus to make a living, right? Um, the more different kinds of living things there will be, okay? One way I'd like to think about this is to say that nature likes surface area, right? So the more places, the more nooks and crannies, the more canopy, right? You see this picture here has lots of vertical space. There are trees, right? That creates a lot of surface area. If you just had a beach, right? That's a very flat surface. Okay, and there's not a lot of places for things to live. Obviously, a lot of things live on the beach, right? The intertidal zone is one of the most interesting and most diverse spaces, but it would be a lot more interesting and a lot more diverse if it had vertical space, okay? Um, <clears throat> one of the reasons that beaches are so biodiverse is because it's literally where land and sea meet, right? So there's a whole world of um, niches on land and a whole world of niches in the sea uh, and when those things come together you get an ecotone, you get an edge effect, right? Very high level of diversity. You also get fresh water and salt water coming together at the same place. 
You also have the air, right? Obviously, so you have flying animals and plants um, that are that are uh, wafting seeds and, and contributing um, to to the to the physical material that's available in that place. Species diversity. This is where this all kind of comes together, right? So this is the variety of species present in a given area. Okay. Um, and uh, Dr. Ariano covered this uh, in great detail, so um, I will refer you to her slides on that. So one of the reasons that we care about biodiversity is that it increases resilience, okay? And resilience is a term borrowed from engineering, um, and it's basically the ability to maintain the function of the ecosystem after a disturbance, okay? Um, which is to say, the different flows of energy and cycling of matter that occurs within this ecosystem. Um, that's, that's its measure of resilience, is how well it kind of hangs together, right? Um, you can think of that in terms of the complexity of the food web, okay? So the more things there are eating, eating other things, the more resilient the food web is, the more resilient the ecosystem is, to disturbance because if any one species gets knocked out, right, everything else is going to be okay because it all it has food. It has, all those other things have other resources to consume. All right, um, <clears throat> in a food web that only has say a couple connections between each node or each species um, in the ecosystem, any one of those connections being knocked out could have very dramatic consequences, right? If, if, if something, so for example, a puma, right, basically only eats deer, okay? Um, and deer are eaten almost exclusively by pumas. There are obviously other carnivores that eat deer, okay? Um, especially fawns, young deer, coyotes in particular. Um, but for the most part, uh, puma and deer are... Um, are very interdependent. So if you eliminate the puma, then the deer population is going to take off and that's going to have all kinds of um, effects uh, based on uh, what the deer themselves eat, right? Um, if the deer disappear, um, the puma is going to go with it for the most part. The puma can have some backup food sources, but for the most part, um, 90 to 95% of the diet of pumas is deer. So <clears throat> that's a very tenuous relationship, right? Um, that's not a very resilient um, uh, relationship there um, because of the fact that they're so specialized, okay? Uh, the the take-home here is that the more genetic, bio, genetic diversity, right, the more genes, the more alleles, the more species there are, the more niches there are, the more likely a given population, biome, or ecosystem is to be resilient, right? And this is especially important in an era of climate change where the zone of tolerance, I'm sorry, the range of tolerance of different species is going to be tested um, with respect to temperature in particular, but also water availability, um, precipitation, and so forth. So think about resilience and climate change as being very closely connected. Uh, what kinds of biodiversity is there in the world, right? Um, insects. <laughs> lots and lots and lots of insects, okay? Um, there's a good number of plants, uh, a good number of arachnids, um, and an even smaller number of vertebrates. So, you know, when we think about um, plants and animals, oftentimes people tend to think of vertebrates, right? Things that have, uh, have, have a skeleton, okay? Um, specifically things that have vertebrae, specifically things that have a spinal column, right? A spinal cord. Um, this is a very small percentage overall of the total biodiversity on land. <laughs> this is just land, right? Um, <clears throat> for the most part, some of the bacteria and roundworms. Um, incidentally, most biodiversity is land-based. Um, the ocean actually has very little biodiversity relative to, to the land. Uh, and this comes down, like I was saying, to this idea that nature likes surface area. Any given spot in the ocean, with the exception of uh, where the ocean meets land, is going to be very similar to other parts of the ocean. Um, temperature is obviously going to be d different at the equator than at the poles, um, but with respect to biodiversity, the ocean again is 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 really not um, not it's it's not as biodiverse as you, as you might think. Um, it's full of life, but um, most of that life is actually very close to shore and very close to the surface. 
so this is just an anecdote um essentially identifying <laughs> that we've known a for a long time that um insects are uh are, are ubiquitous um and as anyone who tries to grow food will tell you um insects are ubiquitous they are very important pollinators uh that give our crops um the ability to make you know make the stuff that we eat we we eat the reproductive organs of, of most vegetables and, and fruits, right? Um, and, and grasses and so forth. Uh, and so in order for those things to mature, um, we, uh, we need pollinators to do that work for us. Um, that's called an ecosystem service, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, obviously, insects are also pests, right? Um, tremendous pests. Anybody who's had to deal with aphids uh, will, will attest to that. Um, you know, here in, in, in Sonoma County um, and in other areas of, of, of California, we have this, this agricultural pest called the glassy wing sharpshooter, right, which is um, potentially very damaging to, um, to viticulture, to, to the grape and, and wine industry here. Um, so these are the kinds of things uh, that insects um, do for us and do to us. Okay. Endemic species... Uh, this is part of biodiversity in the sense that um, an endemic species is a species that exists essentially only in one place, right? And a lot of species are actually endemic. Um, prior to, uh, uh, basically prior to colonialism, um, uh, European colonialism starting in, in the early 1500s, um, much of the globe was, was isolated, right? Um, and so plants and animals had a lot of time to develop very unique and intricate relationships with each other, um, a lot of mutualistic relationships, right? Uh, since then, over the past 500 years or so, uh, basically a lot of mixing has occurred. A lot of organisms have been moved around the planet um, and have become invasive, right? And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, which is to say that uh, they aren't normally found in a given place, and if they don't have the sort of checks on their population that they used to have, their predators are gone, their diseases are gone, or what have you, if they find a food supply, um, they're going to take off, right? Um, so an endemic species could, could be rightly characterized um, as, as the kind of species that a lot of the world um, used to have, and now they're, they're very much threatened, right? Right. Um, and endemic species are much more likely to be threatened than something that's more cosmopolitan just because of the limited range that they have. Um, this is a subset of native species, right, which is a species uh, that did not rely on humans to move them to where they are, okay? Um, <clears throat> you have, this is, this is a, a freshwater shrimp um, that's, that's found in uh, Sonoma County, Napa County, and Marin County. And, it, and it's only found in like 13 different streams. And it requires very clear and clean water um, to live. And uh, so those tributary, those streams get, get um, enhanced protection due to the Endangered Species Act, which, which we'll talk about. Uh, endemism is a lot stronger on islands because there's not a lot of that transfer, right, of organisms from, from one place to another. Um, things that ended up on islands you know, it's very common um, for birds to become flightless when they're on islands because they've lost their predators, right? Um, <clears throat> and so they don't need to fly anymore. Uh, so the, the, the state bird of Hawaii, I believe, is a flightless duck. <laughs> um, and and they, they really can't fly. Uh, when I was a kid, um, I, I, was, I was lucky enough to go to Hawaii and um, saw these ducks, and, and they're very entertaining to watch because normally you would expect a duck to fly away from you, but it doesn't. <laughs> um, essentially, the thing to understand about endemic uh, species and islands is that the farther away uh, from the sort of mainland or the, the larger landmass a given island is, right, um, the, the more endemic species it'll have. Uh, because there's more niches, because it's a larger island, and there's more surface area, right? Um, <clears throat> and there's more nutrients, and so on and so forth. And some organisms require a much larger range, right? Because if you have a larger landmass, you can get more trophic levels, right? You can get predators of predators, okay? As opposed to just producer-consumer predator, okay? Um, <clears throat> and then the larger, yeah, like I say, the larger it is and the farther away it is, the more endemic. Um, endemic species you're going to get. 
So let's talk a little bit about ecosystem services, right? I alluded to this when, when I was discussing, um, discussing insects, okay? Pollination is sort of classic, okay? Um, but these are things that ecosystems do for us that we would otherwise have to pay for, okay? Um, photosynthesis is obviously the most significant. <laughs> um, it converts the light energy of the sun into chemical energy that can be stored and used by living organisms. If we had to do this ourselves, if we had to replace the photosynthesis that's responsible for uh, supporting our population without using plants or animals, without using biology, without using ecosystems, um, we would we would not be able to support anywhere near the population that we have, and we would have to spend a tremendous and tremendous tremendous like our entire economy would be devoted to this. Okay, um, <clears throat> it's just it's 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 unfathomable how um, how important photosynthesis is to us and to our economy, right? Um, <clears throat> another one that I don't include in here, which is obvious, is gravity, <laughs> right? Like if we had to, right? If we had to somehow um, engineer a solution to keeping our feet on the ground. Um, think about so think think about this. How much money and and technology and research and so forth has had to go into putting humans in space? Okay, just to sustain a population of four or five astronauts for a few months, right? That amount of effort would have to go into sustaining all of us if it weren't for ecosystem services. Okay, um, so the ecosystem, right? the planet, living things, um, provide us with our basis for existence, okay? That's, that's the logic behind ecosystem services, right? Um, nutrient cycling is another one of these that we've discussed um, a little bit when we talked about um, the biogeochemical cycles of phosphorus, nitrogen, and carbon, right? Um, replacing those uh, with technology would be incredibly expensive, um, especially at scale. Um, population control, okay? So, <clears throat> um, you know, this is especially important if you think about the different pests that may... Troy, how you doing? Um, that may... <laughs> that may um, that may exist in an agricultural setting, right? Um, <clears throat> or things that aren't pests right now, but could become pests, okay? Um, if people hunt the puma uh, or control puma populations because they're afraid of, of, of mountain lions or what have you, um, the deer population explodes, and the deer come and eat your mom's roses, and then your mom gets really mad, um, and then there's an economic loss, right, of uh, of those those roses dying, right, uh, or your garden. Um, the deer were a menace to my garden in Colorado. Uh, they would eat everything um, except the kale. Uh, <laughs> they ate the tomato plants, um, <clears throat> and so by keeping different uh, populations in control, other animals do us a great service, right? Um, pollination is another big one. Uh, it's estimated, you know, they've, they've got these um, images. If you Google this, you can you can see what a produce section uh, would look like without honeybees, right? Which, by the way, is an invasive species. Um, <laughs> um, it's not a native pollinator. We have literally hundreds of bee species in California um, that are being driven to extinction because of competition from the honeybee and elimination of habitat and the, the flowers that they, they rely on um, to reproduce. And so as, as those bees go extinct, increasingly we rely on um, the non-native invasive European honeybee. Uh, and this, this honeybee um, is expensive to, to maintain and cart around um, to, to different um, agricultural settings. So the annual value of ecosystem services in terms of economics um, is estimated to be about uh, twice the world's total economic production, right? Uh, which is to say that we literally could not, even if we sp spent every dollar, every minute of our lives trying to replace the ecosystem, we could not do it. <laughs> we couldn't even get halfway there, okay? Um, that said, it's hard to put a monetary value on all living things, right? Um, that, uh, that's a challenge, um, even morally, okay? Um, <clears throat> and so you have these two different kinds of value, uh, that are in tension when we talk about ecosystem services or when we talk about the value of living things or biodiversity itself. Um, instrumental value, which basically regards the world as a set of, of things. Um, how useful is this thing to me? What can I get out of this thing? How much could I sell it for? Um... And this is a totally appropriate way to view many things in our life, right? Um, <clears throat> there are numerous examples. 
Um, and then there's intrinsic value, which is the um, sort of the, the antithesis of that, which is um, that you value something just for being what it is or who it is. Um, it's, it's the distinction between an it and a you, right? If I, if I value something or someone intrinsically, it, it means that I don't care whether or not that thing provides me any monetary benefit or any kind of functional purpose or utility, right? Um, it's just, I like the clouds, the clouds are pretty, and I value clouds just because they're clouds, not necessarily because they produce rain or because they shade me from the sun or whatever, right? Um, or reflect the sunlight back up into space, um, preventing global warming, so on and so forth, right? Um, I just think, I just like clouds. Clouds are pretty, um, and they are fun to watch and magical, and I, I think clouds just deserve to exist on their own, right? Um, that's, in, that's intrinsic value. Um, intrinsic value is how we tend to think about things um, that we hold very dear to us, right? Um, like friends or family. Um, you know, we're, we're generally not uh, asked, you know, what's the, what's the monetary value of your mom, right? We, you know, we're generally not asked that question. We generally don't think of how much we care about our friends or family in terms of dollars, right? Um, it's just outside of the realm of the market or of that kind of accounting. Um, so ecosystem services is an, an attempt broadly to put value, um, a monetary value on things that uh, are generally not included in a market. Some other examples here, um, shoreline vegetation protecting a bank from erosion. Um, Yes, many forest uh, products can be harvested, but there are also many things that they do, such as sequester carbon, uh, filter the water, um, and delay uh, runoff until later in the summer so that we're able to have water uh, when it's hot. And of course, many people enjoy spending time in nature, um, and they spend a lot of money uh, to do so. This is another example um, which I'll move past. You can look, take a look at this uh, on your own time if you desire. Conservation. So let's cover conservation. So we've talked about biodiversity. Conservation, um, it, you know, it has the root word conserve, which is to say to maintain, um, to protect, to ensure a continued presence of, and so forth. Um, notice I don't say preserve. It's not preservation. Conservation and preservation are two different things in the environmental movement. Preservation um, is, broadly speaking, a, uh, well, Chuck, Dr. Chuck Striplin um, would say a, um, a, a white person's invention um, when they came to the Americas um, and uh, looked at the land and said, this land is wild, as opposed to recognizing that it had been managed for thousands of years. Um, and so uh, when environmentalists um, in the you know, 1950s and 60s and 70s uh, looked out there and said, we should preserve this land, this land should be preserved, which is to say no one should be on it or use it for any purposes. It should be left alone. We shouldn't manage it, right? So the Wilderness Act, national parks are both kinds of examples where our society has deemed preservation uh, to be the appropriate course of action, whether or not that's well-founded is another conversation. Conservation basically says these lands matter uh, and we're going to manage them for certain things. We're going to try to get certain things out of this land. Um, and so when we're talking about um, species conservation, right, and we're, we're, we're discussing um, how we're going to manage certain species, okay? So this is, uh, this is an invasive species. It's something that um, when we think about how we're going to manage a species or manage a landscape, how we're going to do conservation, um, we, we tend to want to get rid of these invasive species, right? Because they do economic damage um, and because they uh, compete with native species, many times out-competing them, right? Because they don't have their natural predators. Um, and because the habitat in which they now find themselves is suitable for their growth, okay? Um, <clears throat> so this is the yellow star thistle, and if you try to, if you're a cow, 
or a deer and you try to take a bite of this thing, you're going to get one of these lodged in your mouth and it's going to get infected and you're going to die, right? Um, <clears throat> and so you learn not to eat these things because they're sharp and pointy, which is a great defense. And this is why this thing has managed to take off and do so well here in California. Um, but it's a, it's a menace. Um, it's a menace if, if you uh, run cattle um, or if you're even just trying to um, maintain any kind of meadow because obviously any natural grazer is not going to eat this, and then all of the uh, other plants that would be growing here are the ones that are going to be eaten. Um, and that's going to mean that whatever depended on those other plants, the pollinators, the other insects, right? Go back to Dr. Ariano's lecture about the the one-to-one the -one relationship, the necessary relationship between that butterfly and that particular species of plant. Right? If that plant goes away, then that butterfly is going to have a really hard time. Right? Um, <clears throat> and so those kinds of relationships exist, those kinds of co-evolutionary relationships exist throughout all of nature. And when something like this comes through, it disrupts all of those relationships. This is another example of a yellow flower that is a total and complete menace. It's broom. You can hear it discussed as Scotch broom or French broom or Spanish broom. These are all different colloquial names or different species for the same basic growth habit, which is a shrub, um, which has seeds that persist in the soil for decades um, and are extremely difficult to remove. Um, fire doesn't even do it. Um, so this, this literally, the way that this is managed is you have to go out there and pull it by hand, okay? And you just have to keep doing that for years uh, because of how long the seeds will persist in the soil. And then obviously the sooner you get to it, the better. Uh, because the longer you wait, the more impossible the solution is. Um, <clears throat> there are, in fact, even specific tools, <laughs> hand tools that have been invented um, for, for pulling weeds uh, and, and are particularly useful on these plants. Um, these plants do the same thing, except they um, are even worse because they're taller, so they shade out all the other plants um, that could possibly grow around it even more thoroughly. This is another yellow flower that is a menace. This is an invasive aquatic weed, Ludwigia. Um, I deal with it personally in my job um, at the water board. Uh, it, um, it causes all kinds of problems. Um, this, should be, this should be a wetland. This should be a marsh. This should be a wet meadow. This should be even open water um, that this person is standing and walking in. It should be a, a patchwork of those kinds of habitats. Um, but instead, it's just a blanket of this plant, which has um, very low value in terms of biodiversity. Um, it, it's invasive. It doesn't have anything that relies on it in particular. It outcompetes everything else and all the things that rely on it. Um, it also has very serious and negative water quality consequences because of its ability to stop and trap sediment and shallow the water and stagnate it and turn it into um, turn it anoxic, which is to say, when this plant dies and decomposes, all the oxygen is is depleted from the water, um, creating a, a basically a dead zone, right? So, when we think about conservation, uh, those are some spe those are some primary things that we're worried about, like invasive species, but we're also worried about our impacts on the environment distinct from ferrying around these invasive species, right? The invasive species component is just one piece, right? Um, there's also obviously pollution, which damages the air quality, which makes it, and eventually this leads into our lungs and the lungs of other living things. And all these particles and all this chemistry falls out into, into our waterways, right? Um, and so <clears throat> ultimately that's going to damage the habitat um, of, of species that we care about. Um, overfishing, right? Uh, that's a very serious conservation challenge um, with respect to native fisheries, which we'll talk about when we talk about the tragedy of the commons. Um, climate change, that's another one, right? That's another threat to biodiversity um, that is a conservation challenge, right? Um, this polar bear is an example, okay? So it's one of the early casualties of climate change. Um, it's, it's simply not able to hunt um, because the ice flows, that it, the icebergs that it would normally, um, normally use for that purpose um, are, are gone, right? Um, and so its entire habitat um, has shrunk 
and in some places has been eliminated. Um, <clears throat> and then ultimately habitat destruction and fragmentation, and that's the biggest challenge uh, that, that we face with respect to conservation. <clears throat> So as you can see, even just looking at vertebrates, right, which was that tiny little elephant in the diagram that was in the lower left, okay, this is just for vertebrates. Um, <clears throat> David, hello. Uh, <laughs> that essentially, if you look at this graph, you can see agriculture and aquaculture, logging, residential commercial development, and we just stop right there those top three, that's all habitat loss. That's all conversion of grasslands, right, to, to, um, to agriculture. That's all conversion of forests into, um, into plantations, right, into timber plantations um, and clear cuts. And then residential commercial development, that's all conversion of any given type of landscape into, into cities and housing. So basically what we're talking about when we talk about threats to, to, to biodiversity is we're talking about our footprint on the planet. We're talking literally how much area we're taking up. Um, there are other threats, right, that have been more prominent um, throughout time. We have invasive species. That's obviously a big one. Pollution, hunting, and trapping. Um, that was a big deal in North America. Um, you know, if you, there's the, the, the discussion of the, of overfishing of the salmon stocks, um, and, um, of the beaver trapping and so forth was, it was remarkable, um, in, in the 1800s and 1700s and 1600s, um, entire populations were wiped out, if not, if not, um, endemic species that we may not have even known existed. Um, but for the most part, right, if you look at, all these threats, the ones that reign supreme are habitat loss and fragmentation. These up here, okay? Um, and those are the biggest, that's the biggest challenge. If there's one way that we, uh, in the future, could reduce our impact uh, on the environment is to literally shrink the footprint, the area in which we, um, we operate and exclude, exclude native species from operating. Okay, so this is where we ended, the exploding brain meme. And I'm going to take us out to the end of this lecture, uh, and then we'll take a break, and we'll cover water, water resources. So when we think about setting land aside for nature, right, I've mentioned that the, the most important thing we can do um, is to connect natural habitat, natural ecosystems to each other, um, and right to avoid fragmentation and to simply leave the spaces that are currently alone alone um, and not increase our footprint um, through suburban sprawl or through mining uh, or through timber operations and so forth. Basically, how do we get better at doing what we do in less area? Okay, um, And while we're doing that, how do we manage or conserve and steward the lands that are left, right? And this is, this is a, a, something that is sort of unique, or I shouldn't say unique, but that is um, exceptionally important in North and, and South America. Um, the quote-unquote old world uh, had expansive and extensive um, domination uh, by human beings um, in in quasi um, in 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 mass mass uh, areas and numbers um, in ways that were different and distinct from what was happening in North and South America with respect to biodiversity. Um, Europe is basically all farmland. There's uh, having been there. There's very little natural land, quote unquote natural land. Um, it's it's very. Uh, there's a tremendous lack of biodiversity in Europe. Um, part of that is because of the destructiveness of the industrial wars that were fought in the 1900s. Um, there's nothing worse for the environment than war um, because of the demand on resources and the utter destruction that's wrought. Um, <clears throat> Asia uh, has more biodiversity than Europe. Um, Africa has more than Asia. Um, but the Americas basically have the most, um, and that's a reflection of um, the kind of impact that human beings had. And so if we're, if we're 
being in California, which is a biodiversity hotspot, um, it's incumbent on us to steward that biodiversity uh, for future generations. And, and the way to do that, basically, is to follow this chart. Bigger is better. Connectivity is good. One large is better than several small. And less edge is better, okay? So circles, right? Things that have... This is one instance where lower surface area is better. Um, and <laughs> the larger the circle, the better. And the bigger the connection between those two circles, the better, right? Part of this, this ultimately has to do with the fact that, again, some species rely on this entire circle. They need a big range in order to function. So they're not going to be able to function here with these disconnected smaller habitats, right? They need the single connected big habitat. And not only that, it needs to be big. It needs to be, it needs to have a core, right? If it's just a weird squiggly line or, or has lots of edge, right? There's a lot going on at that edge that something like a puma really can't tolerate, right? It needs a large expansive space and it doesn't do well next to urban or suburban areas, right? So if you've got a lot of human activity occurring at the edge, the puma is not going to it's not going to have. It's not going to inhabit that area. It needs this large, uh, large area with with secluded places to den, right? It needs places to raise its 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 kittens, and it and it's not going to find a safe place to do that um, if it has a high surface area, um, uh, with, to to volume ratio, right? Um, there are several co uh, approaches to conservation bio biology. Um, so while we're thinking about how we ought to manage the landscape, we also need to think about um, the other levels of conservation, right? Um, not just landscapes, but ecosystems and single species. Uh, so the most common approach in the United States, uh, at least the most, I shouldn't say common, the most prominent approach is the single species approach. And this is uh, embodied in the Endangered Species Act, which basically puts forth the moral claim that human beings have no right to exterminate an entire species. Um, <clears throat> and so from that moral value judgment, right, science policy values, that triad um, that I discussed earlier in the course, from that value judgment comes a policy of the Endangered Species Act, right? And through that policy, we are going to use science to enact our particular policy goal, right, which is enumerated in the values, okay? Um, <clears throat> so those species may or may not be keystone species, indicator species, or flagship species. Um, ignore that comma at the end of flagship species. A keystone species is one uh, that, because of the way that it operates in the ecosystem, because of what it eats, um, has a tremendous amount of influence on the structure of the ecosystem of what everything else eats and what other things are present. The common example for this is the wolf, um, which when it was reintroduced to Yellowstone caused all kinds of ecosystem changes um, and made the ecosystem broadly more biodiverse and healthier. The reason for this is that they started to hunt the elk. Right, and they they kept the elk on the move, so the elk couldn't just graze willy nilly wherever they wanted. They kept the elk moving around, and so whenever the elk were left alone, they ate whatever was present. Um, and so the overgrazing went down because the elk population not only did it go down due to hunting, but it also was kept on the move, um, and so only ate certain kinds of plants because it would preferentially eat what it liked the best or whatever was available in the place that it stopped. Right? And they couldn't just wipe out everything that was present. Um, <clears throat> that led to changes in uh, the number of trees and the kinds of trees that were growing um, and actually increased water quality because the, um, the drainages uh, became more stable because of the increase in trees and shrubs. Um, and, and so just the introduction of the wolf literally changed the hydrology of the landscape. There was less erosion, okay, that was occurring in the landscape once the wolf was reintroduced. 
An indicator species is something that um, by monitoring and paying attention to, we can get a sense of what's happening in the ecosystem. It might not be a keystone species, but it's basically just an indicator. It, 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 <laughs> uh, duh. Uh, it basically just tells us, it's like the, it's like the dashboard in, your, in, in a car that lights up, you know, the check engine light. That's basically what an indicator species is. Um, <clears throat> flagship species, that's something that people really care about, right? That's like the banana slug in Santa Cruz County, okay? Um, <clears throat> it's something, it's something that, that people really like, um, that's, that's, you know, cute and charismatic, um, and, and that people want to see protected. Um, and so when you protect those species, oftentimes what you're doing is you're protecting a whole ecosystem because that species depends on a lot of different things in order to live and survive, right? What does it need to feed and what does it need to breed? We'll talk about that with the Endangered Species Act in a minute, but that ends up being what you do. You protect its critical habitat. An ecosystem approach doesn't necessarily look at any given species, but it does look at the entire ecosystem as a whole and focuses on restoring uh, or protecting the um, habitats, the physical integrity, um, right? Like I was talking about with the, uh, the hydrology, where the stream is, how the stream evolves over time, right? That influences what species are going to be present. Um, the nutrients that are cycled and at what rate, all of these things are the focus of an ecosystem approach. A landscape approach connects the ecosystems. It looks at an even bigger picture than just a single ecosystem. It wants to connect the different ecosystems. So it wants to connect the mountains to the foothills to the plains, right? And give animals and plants the opportunity to be moved and to move up and down that whole, um, all those different kinds of ecosystems and even down to the river, to the ocean, right? So it's an integrated um, protection that focuses on multiple ecosystems and covers a very large area. This is an example of something that's built in the mountain west to connect different ecosystems, right? Fragmentation being bad. This is going to connect. Um, it's, it's literally a path <laughs> for animals to walk over the road. Um, and so they're coming from the mountains up here or they're headed to the mountains up here and they don't have to get run over by a car, basically. Um, and so this connects, this integrates, right? This links different ecosystems, the uplands from uh, from the plains, okay? Um, and so it, it provides an opportunity for, uh, for large animals in particular to move back and forth across the landscape. So here are some tools for conservation biology. Obviously, pollution controls are important, okay? That's the Clean Water Act, that's the Clean Air Act, that's the Safe Drinking Water Act, that's that whole bevy of, um, of, of legislation that, that exists in the United States to protect ecosystems um, as well as people um, from, from industry. Uh, protected areas, basically saying you can't do X, Y, or Z in a given place, okay? Um, there are some examples here, wild and scenic rivers, national monuments, um, and so forth. This is obviously uh, an ideologically fraught idea um, because, you know, of the, the, the fact that um, Native people did, in fact, um, live in and manage and affect uh, these areas uh, prior to European colonialism. Bans on take. So this is, this is basically how the Endangered Species Act operates. It says you're literally not allowed to kill anything that's on this list. You can't even harass it. You can't, it, it shouldn't even know that you're there, <laughs> right? Um, <clears throat> there are instances where you can get permits to take species, um, but those are hard to get, uh, and they involve a lot of paperwork and time. Um, and density and development, this is a big deal. This is what I was talking about previously when it comes to, you know, the threats to biodiversity. What's one of the most important things we can do to preserve biodiversity? Well, we can live more densely. Urban planning, we need to promote density um, and, and contract our urban suburban sprawl. Um, we need to build up, not out. Right, and a lot of that is going to be moving away from cars uh, as as the primary mode of transportation, and moving towards walking, biking, and, and public transit once the coronavirus is over. Um, 
That also means intensifying to the extent possible agriculture. You know, we're going to have agriculture. We need it to be very efficient, right? We need it to produce maximal nutrition on minimal area. Um, and some of that is going to require industry. Uh, but a lot of times what it really means if you're um, trying to do it well without having pollution and so forth, it means more people are going to need to be farmers. Um, right now, maybe 1% to 2% of our population in the United States works in agriculture, um, and that would need to go up substantially um, in order for us to do agriculture well by the environment. Um, ecotourism, so one of the methods here basically to keep these areas um, relatively unimpacted by industry is um, is to basically monetize the aesthetic value of ecology, right? To, to basically get people to pay to come look at pretty stuff, all right? Or to come hunt big stuff or to come look at really big rocks sticking out of the ground like El Capitan or Half Dome or something like that, okay? To go hike around in it. Um, basically, you monetize it. You, you, you give it over to the market and you say, people are going to pay a certain amount of money to come here and, and check this stuff out. And so we're going to keep making money doing that and we're not going to turn this into a timber plantation or a mine or a farm or whatever it is, right? We're not going to put a city here um, because people are already paying good money uh, to come do this stuff. Debt for nature swaps. Uh, so this is um, this is something actually if you've been paying attention to the Democratic primary that Joe Biden has talked about um, that he promoted this which basically is the idea that if a, if a country owes the World Bank or the IMF um, a lot of money um, IMF being the International Monetary Fund if they owe them a lot of money then um, well instead of uh, giving us all that money how about you just agree to not cut down this forest or how about you agree to protect this river or what have you? Basically, it's an agreement that reduces the debt of a country um, in exchange for a commitment to protect nature. This is basically a payment for ecosystem services, although it's not couched exactly that way. Um, ultimately, gear restrictions are also a really important tool here. So this is basically saying, if you want to click this link and, and check out this, I think it's a video on the vaquita, which is a porpoise in the Gulf of Mexico, or it was, I, it's, um, it's a goner. Um, basically, by changing what kind of fishing hook or fishing line or fishing net you use, um, you can dramatically reduce the quote-unquote bycatch, which is to say the species that you catch that you didn't intend to catch. Um, and you can focus specifically on a, uh, a given fish and a given species that you know has a population that can handle the fishing pressure that you're putting on it. So the last thing we'll talk about before we take a break is the Endangered Species Act, um, which was passed in 1973, um, thank you Richard Nixon, requires the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to do a few things. Um, it, to develop, and, and by the way, Fish and Wildlife Service used to be, and in many ways still is, specifically focused on, on promoting hunting and fishing. Um, and they've done terrible, awful things to the, to the rivers and streams of this country by introducing terrible invasive <laughs> fish to those places um, because they're the kinds of fish that, uh, that, that, that wealthy white people want to fish for, uh, right? Um, they, in fact, still stock streams uh, with, with fish species that eat native species and compete with them. Um, and although now, in some cases, they've stopped stocking them, uh, they refuse to exterminate them, even if they're threatening endangered species. So this is an agency that is not all, uh, all for ecosystem conservation or biodiversity conservation um, uh, in, in all its forms. Part of their budget depends on promoting hunting and fishing of particular things that often competes uh, with, with their desire to, uh, or their mandate to protect endangered species. Basically, they develop a list of endangered and threatened species. So this, to, so for a species to become listed is to go through a process of being declared either endangered or threatened. Um, and you can do that. You, literally, you or I could go um, and petition the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to list a species. Uh, Usually it's a scientist. <laughs> Usually it's a whole bevy of scientists that do this with uh, lots of money from environmental groups because it's a very expensive and very long process um, that the 
George W. Bush administration ground largely to a halt. The Obama administration picked up, um, and the Trump administration has again ground to a halt. Um, develop plans for recovery of these endangered species. So once it's listed, you have to say how it is that you're going to get this species off the list, right? Um, what are you going to do to ensure that this species is no longer at risk of extinction, okay? Um, and then ultimately, you have to actually implement those plans. Um, and this link gives you some indication of the 34 species that have been recovered and the 10 that have gone extinct. <clears throat> of, of the literally thousands that are listed. Um, basically, it's illegal to kill, disturb, transport, etc., which is to say take an endangered species. It's illegal for the feds to disturb an endangered species' critical habitat, and that is, again, what it needs to feed and breed. So this can be extremely expansive, right? Um, this critical habitat piece uh, is, is, is really where the rubber meets the road. It's really where um, industry and development interests um, go to the map to fight against declaring critical habitat because that habitat ultimately is where they want to discharge their pollution or it's where they want to build their mall or what have you. Um, in Sonoma County, um, especially in the Santa Rosa Plain, there's an endangered species called the tiger, California tiger salamander. Um, and uh, <laughs> there, it, it depends on wetlands, in particular, a particular kind of wetland called a vernal pool, which is basically uh, a body of water that has no fish that exists for a few months out of the year and this, so that this animal can lay its eggs, those eggs can hatch, um, it can grow from its larval stage into its more mature stage, and then it can, it can walk away once the vernal pool dries out. Um, vernal pools uh, are hard to protect because you have to basically tell agriculture and, um, and developers don't put anything there. This is a vernal pool, you have to leave it alone. Um, and so uh, developers have uh, developed uh, and, and agriculture have developed this sort of workaround in, in Sonoma County where um, they do these mitigation sites where they build vernal pools. Well, the vernal pools that they build, uh, although they can still be declared critical habitat, are often not connected to any other vernal pools. And so there's no way for uh, a tiger salamander to get to those vernal pools, or if it were there, to get out of those vernal pools and go and breed with the, uh, the rest of the population um, in Sonoma County. So the designation of the critical habitat, again, is where you're going to see a lot of shenanigans um, from different actors that want to uh, undermine uh, the ESA. Um, you cannot consider economics in deciding whether to list a species. So basically, if you list a species and it's going to cost the economy $100 billion because now you can't do whatever project you want it to do, too bad, right? You have to, uh, you, can, you still have to list the species because the science says that it's going to go extinct. Although, uh, the Trump administration has recently uh, put forward a proposal um, to, to change that, um, to basically say that uh, you can delist a species because it's going to cost too much um, to protect it. But you can, and this is from a 1978 amendment, already consider economics determining critical habitat. So you can say, this species is in danger of going extinct, uh, but we're going to exclude this part of its critical habitat because that's going to be too expensive, right? Um, this is a bit of a back door, it's a bit of a loophole. Um, industry wanted this and they got it. Uh, but it hasn't been used as extensively as you might think. Three things that are important to understand about the Endangered Species Act are these terms. Endangered, basically in danger of extinction throughout all or a significant portion of its range. Um, threatened, likely to become endangered, so likely to be in danger of extinction very soon within the foreseeable future. Okay. Um, and these are afforded different levels of protection by the feds. In California, threatened species are treated as endangered. So in California, the California Endangered Species Act basically says if it's threatened, it gets the same protection as endangered, right? Um, the God Squad, right? So this is very interesting. The God Squad is, is, is a group of um, high-ranking administration officials uh, that go through a very involved process that can determine that a federal action is acceptable despite the risk of, risk of extinction because there are no reasonable and prudent alternatives to the action that the feds are trying to, trying to implement. And that can just be approving a permit. So they don't have to be the ones building the pipeline or the bridge or the dam or whatever. A private entity can be doing that, but they need a federal permit. So the feds 
have to issue that permit. That's an action. Is there a reasonable or prudent alternative to doing that? The God Squad gets to decide. This is very rarely used, but essentially what it does is provide an opportunity for our society to step back and say, hey, you know what? Uh, tough shit. This thing's going to die. It's going to go extinct. It's going to be big dead. And that's the end of it. Very rarely used. Like literally a handful of times. Less than five. Right? In the history of the act. This is the tiger salamander. Uh, it's cute. It's big. Um, it, I admit, looks a little silly. <laughs> it's face at least. Um, but... Like I was saying, it, it relies on these vernal pools, um, and uh, the interesting story about the tiger salamander is that it was all considered one species, and the tiger, the California tiger salamander has a very large range, which covers a lot of California, but the population that's in Sonoma County has been isolated for literally a million years from the rest of that population, right, from the rest of the species, and so... Through enough genetic analysis and work, it was determined that this is actually a distinct species, right? Because it doesn't actually breed with any of the other uh, populations that exist in California. And it hasn't for over a million years. They were able to do the genetics on that. Basically, how many mutations, how different does the DNA look of this guy, this critter, from the other critters? Um, and the more differences there are, the longer it's been since they've been breeding. Um, the Endangered Species Act uses this biological species concept, right? So it uses this concept of do they breed in the wild, right? To determine whether or not it's a, it's a species. This was a huge fight that happened in the early 2000s as to whether this thing was its own species. Industry and developers and agriculture really didn't want this thing to be called its own species, right? Um, there were a bunch of scientists actually out of UC Davis that fought really hard to show that this was in fact a unique, uh, a unique species. Um, the fact that this thing was declared its own unique species is one of the key reasons that suburban sprawl um, and conversion to uh, to vineyards has been slower in Sonoma County than it would have been otherwise. Um, <clears throat> this gets to a, a sort of this is a bit of a side track, but there's this big debate in taxonomy about lumpers and splitters. Basically, people who want to say all this is really just one species, they want to lump all these things together and call it one species, and splitters who want to say, well, these are all different species and they all should get their own unique protections. And so if you're, if you're a savvy uh, developer or um, industrialist or, or agriculturalist, you get a bunch of lumpers on your side. Um, and you get them to write papers and do studies that say all these splitters are wrong. These are not individually distinct species. They're really part of this broader species. Um, and so we can wipe out whatever's here, right? Um, so this is kind of an esoteric academic debate, but it has very big policy and ecological implications. So it's really hard to recover species. Uh, and the answer is because individuals need a lot of different things, right? They need a place to eat. They need stuff to eat and they need shelter, okay? What do populations need? Ultimately, they need breeding sites. They need opportunities to mate, find each other and mate, and then they need places to rear their young if that's part of what they do. Otherwise, they just lay their eggs and leave. Um, what kinds of species are likely to be endangered? Well, um, the species that are likely to be endangered are endemic species, right? because they have spent a lot of time evolving in one place and are not used to the threats that they now face, and they are very small in terms of their range and their population size, okay? Um, they're not very resilient. Uh, and specialists, right? We talked about generalists versus specialists. Specialists are far more likely to be endangered because they have fewer options, right, if something in their, in their environment changes. Um, and then ultimately, the causes of peril, as we talked about, that is, um, that is habitat loss, right? Habitat loss, habitat loss, habitat loss. It is the single largest contributor to species extinction um, and to species endangerment in the world. That chart again drives it home. Um, okay, so uh, when we're actually recovering a species... Um, De facto considerations of economics do come in in the recovery plans. These are highly political documents um, as to what is actually going to be done to recover a species. One needs only look at the 
California, um, the Delta, the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta, um, and the endangered species there, particularly the Delta smelt, uh, to identify that this is very political. Um, recovery plans generally don't involve rewilding, so they generally don't involve removing human habitats or removing um, malls and parking lots. They generally don't involve um, stopping agriculture from a particular occurring in a particular place. We're not going and ripping out vineyards because the California tiger salamander needs that land, right? Um, occasionally, some things are stopped. For example, in the Pacific Northwest, there was this thing called the Northern Spotted Owl, which was an endangered species and relied specifically on old growth forests. It had to be old growth forest. Otherwise, it didn't have its critical habitat. It didn't have what it needed to feed and breed. Um, and as a result, a lot of logging got stopped. Um, and a lot of people lost their jogs and a lot of uh, industries went, a lot of companies went bankrupt. Um, and there's a lot of resentment in the Pacific North Northwest uh, towards towards big government uh, for doing that to them. And it's very hard to find adequate funding uh, for most species. So there's literally, like I said, thousands on the list. Um, very few even have recovery plans. Um, it's it's really sort of a graveyard of of, you know, yeah, they're listed, uh, we might have a plan, and it might have money behind it, and it might be something we're actually doing. Um, so, Endangered Species Act, very interesting and powerful in concept. Um, in practice, uh, hasn't been as successful as um, the people who wrote it and the scientists and environmentalists who supported it wanted, um, but certainly it's really pissed off uh, a lot of agriculture um, and a lot of industry and a lot of developers. Um, so it's probably doing what it's meant to do, which uh, is interface uh, business uh, with, with ecology uh, and prevent one from completely dominating the other. Um, okay, so with that, I'm going to um, have everybody take a break. We're going to come back at uh, 7.55, uh, and then we're going to go ahead and start in on uh, water resources, my specialty. Okay. See everyone in a little bit. I'm going to mute. Oh, Taos, New Mexico. This Pueblo has been continuously inhabited for probably, well, hundreds, certainly, maybe thousands of years. Who knows? Um, very cool place. Uh, yeah, with that, go ahead, do your thing, um, and come back in eight minutes. Thanks.
check, 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 check. Mic check. Mic check. Okay. Welcome back, everyone. Um, so what I want from... Whoop, I signed out of my email. Not what I wanted. All right, so what I would like everyone who is listening right now to do is either in the chat or via email. We lost a concurrent viewer, that's sad. Um, <laughs> either in the chat or via email to write me, write to all, um, what the largest threat to biodiversity is. Um, this is a way of both determining whether or not I have effectively conveyed the information and of confirming that you are present, accounted for, and listening. So again, um, <clears throat> this is like my role taking, right? Uh, because I'm refusing to use Zoom because they sell the information to Facebook and I'd rather that Google have the information. Um, <clears throat> go ahead and let me know what you think the greatest threat to biodiversity is, uh, the biggest challenge for biological conservation, okay? So either do that via email or do that in the chat. And while you do that, I am going to... Get this lecture going. Maybe not right away. Wait. That's wrong. There we go. Okay. Stephanie, nailed it. Everybody else still has to write something, though. <laughs> Cece, I like your response. Read, solid. Yeah, CC. We'll talk about that actually in just a just a second. Uh, Wendy, I was just asking for the largest threat to uh, to species conservation, the biggest threat to biodiversity uh, around the world. So while y'all are, are responding, and I'm sure you can experience the lag again. I don't know how long it is. Um, <clears throat> seems like it's about 30 seconds to a minute. Um, the, the threat of climate change is absolutely going to cause habitat loss, right? Um, so what climate change is going to do, because different species have different ranges of tolerance with respect to temperature, water needs, um, and so forth, they're going to move throughout the landscape, wherever they can, to maintain that homeostasis, right? To maintain uh, their happy place. Um, and <clears throat> if that happy place doesn't exist anymore, right? Because climate change has occurred and now the temperature is way too high or there's like persistent aridity and so now there's not enough water or um, now because of the intensity of the storms, the rivers are flowing at really high rates at very high frequencies, you know, uh, many times a year or, you know, the flood that used to happen every 10 years happens every two years or something like that. As those things occur, effectively what happens is the species that relied on the old climate have lost habitat, right? 
um, they've lost the things that they need to feed and breed, right? Um, <clears throat> even if the landscape hasn't been quote unquote developed, right? Um, <clears throat> so that's an interesting, that's kind of like a way of getting at habitat loss through climate change. Um, <clears throat> Now, climate change itself will, of course, threaten threaten extinction, especially of endemic species, where um, the direct effects of of you know a particular storm or a particular drought or of a particular heat wave or whatever um, that was unprecedented in the previous climate um, occurs. But by and large, we're still looking at habitat loss um, as being the the greatest, the greatest threat. Um, and I, I would say, um, Anahi, not necessarily just human activity, um, but the activity of some particular people in particular places in particular times, um, is, is what, what drives it, uh, what drives habitat loss, right? Um, <clears throat> and, and, and this is not to say that, any one particular person or group is, is, you know, more or less to blame necessarily of the overall picture. Uh, but, um, in any given place, there's going to be a particular set of people that are doing particular things, um, that are, that's damaging the environment, quote unquote, the environment. And, and oftentimes what they're doing to damage it is, is the destruction of the habitat of, of these other species, right. Um, that, that they share the planet with. Okay, great. So thank you, uh, everyone, for um, for responding. Um, please, please either again send me an email or uh, or respond in the chat uh, so that I can. Um, Jimmy and Jennifer, I see your emails. Awesome. Okay, so we've got about uh, an hour and a half to. Uh, to bang out water resources, so so let's get going. I need to make a disclaimer because um, basically tell you that uh, not only am I not a lawyer, uh, but I am speaking in my capacity as a private individual, not as an employee of the North Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board. So any opinions or ideas expressed herein are solely of the speaker and not of the North Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board. Okay, good, great, thank you. Moving on. So you all have probably at some point seen the water cycle, right? You've probably all at some point seen a diagram that looks a little bit like the one I'm going to show you next that basically covers how water moves throughout the planet, right? Um, we talked about the carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, phosphorus cycle. Well, here's another cycle, right? The water cycle. Um, water being two hydrogen atoms bonded to an oxygen atom, H2O, um, and it itself has a cycle. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things that we have to understand before we can talk about the water cycle is to recognize that there are a good number of um, kinds of water on the planet, right? Um, there's fresh water, which basically has almost no salt in it, okay? Zero to one half a part per trillion, right? So of every trillion water molecules, there is not even one molecule of salt, okay? For every two trillion, there is at most one molecule of salt, okay? And typically we're talking about NaCl, we're talking about sodium chloride, right? Um, but there are other salts. Uh, the most dominant one in the, in, in, in the world though is sodium chloride. Um, <clears throat> fresh water is the most useful to humans and land plants and animals, okay? Um, any saltier than that, it, and it starts to become difficult for things to grow, um, and, and you yourself will have a very hard, um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, part per thousand. I said part per trillion. Part per thousand. <laughs> PPT is part per thousand. Um, <clears throat> any more than 0.5 or so, and it's going to start to change the osmotic balance of your body, you're basically going to be getting too much salt. Um, now, I know that Pedialyte <laughs> or any other kind of rehydration product is going to have more salt uh, than fresh water because we're trying to replace lost electrolytes. We're trying to replace that, um, that lost sodium. 
um, and that loss chloride, we're trying to return the osmotic balance. Um, but for the most part, for your everyday uh, consumption, fresh water needs to be basically salt free. Um, there's this other type of water called brackish water, and um, that is water that is a mix of salt water and fresh water. So that's the kind of water that you're going to find in estuaries um, where the ocean and the sea meet. Um, and it's also common in deep aquifers. So uh, the thing about salt is that it sinks, right? So um, as time goes on, uh, thousands, millions of years progress, whenever erosion occurs, whenever, whenever uh, minerals are dissolved into water that runs off the mountains and into the, into the land and, and into the groundwater, um, it carries the salt with it. And over time, that salt continuously moves down to the bottom of the aquifer. So the deeper you go, the saltier the water gets. Which is why groundwater is only really drinkable in certain places. Because it's fresh when it's towards the surface. The deeper you get, um, and the longer it's been there, the saltier it is. Salt water, this is between uh, 30 and 50 parts per thousand, not trillion, thousand. Um, <clears throat> and this is primary oceans and, and salt lakes, right? So the Great Salt Lake in Utah, um, there are some inland seas like the Black Sea, or I'm sorry, um, <clears throat> uh, like the Red Sea and so forth. Um, that is salt water, right? Um, that, is, uh, that is highly concentrated. You drink it, you die kind of thing. Um, and it's just not potable or potable. It's not drinkable. Um, <clears throat> briny water is almost always artificial, um, and it's generally produced, um, by, uh, human beings. It's not always produced by human beings, but, um, basically this is what happens when you take seawater and squeeze all the salt out of it, um, because you're trying to make fresh water, uh, through reverse osmosis, and then you have this very concentrated brine, this, this, um, water that's got lots and lots of salt in it, um, and then you pump it back out into the ocean. And so the salt dis dissipates um, back into the ocean. Uh, it has local impacts right where you've discharged it, but uh, the ocean's very big, and so it doesn't have very uh, large consequences throughout the rest of, um, rest of the ocean. So the water cycle. Here it is. This is our good friend. Um, most of the water is in the ocean, <laughs> right? Um, a, a, you know, less than a percent is in groundwater, uh, and then even less than that is in the atmosphere. Those are your major reservoirs um, besides snow and ice, which has about as much, uh, as much water as the groundwater. Um, what you'll notice about this is that not a lot of this is actually drinkable, right? The snow and ice in the atmosphere, the rivers, the lakes, and so forth, um, that's fresh water. That's stuff we can drink. Um, can't drink the ocean water, and a lot of the groundwater is not drinkable because it's salty, right? Uh, so essentially what you're looking at here is that um, less than, you know, 3% or whatever it was, right, of, uh, of the oceans, of, of the world's, of the planet's water is, is fresh water and drinkable. Depending on where you want to start in the water cycle, um, typically you would start with evaporation. This then ends up as vapor, so it's a gas phase, it's in the atmosphere, it cools off, it condenses um, into liquid phase. Those droplets then uh, grow as they adhere to each other, um, and it falls from the sky as precipitation. That is either in liquid or solid phase, right? So as snow, sleet, hail, whatever. Um, or as rain, mist, drizzle, whatever. Um, <clears throat> once it lands, uh, it again either basically runs off the surface into a river or a lake. Um, eventually, you know, if it's ice, if it's building a glacier, it's not going to go anywhere for a long time. But eventually that melts um, and runs off. Uh, it also then infiltrates into the ground. Okay, and, one, and, and water moves underground but it moves very slowly uh, underground. And so it might take, you know, uh, weeks, days, maybe months for water to move um, from the mountains to the ocean via the surface. 
through the ground, it's going to take thousands or millions of years. Um, and it may never even get there uh, because there might be a blockage. There might be something in the way, basically like an underground dam, um, you know, a piece of the geology that water simply can't flow through. Uh, it might just get stuck there. Um, so this is, this is fundamentally the water cycle. Um, and what it's missing, of course, is the human influence and it's missing plants, right? Um, it's missing transpiration, which is what plants do when they take water from through their roots, through from the ground and put it back into the atmosphere as vapor. So let's talk about that, okay? Um, for your information, by the way, this lecture, lecture eight, is not on the exam, all right? Um, this exam two. It'll be on exam three, and I will tell you that the water cycle is a very important part <laughs> of exam three. Um, it's going to be important for you to be able to use these terms, okay? Um, evaporation is liquid to vapor without plants, okay? Uh, transpiration is liquid to vapor through plants. Uh, and you can see that occurring in the diagram here, transpiration from the plants, evaporation from the water surface, right? And evapotranspiration is what occurs when both is happening, okay? Um, it's kind of the catch-all category which asks how much water vapor is the landscape putting off, right? And that's what people who study this kind of thing are generally most interested in, is they want to know how much water vapor is coming off the land. Right? And, and they care less, typically, about how much is coming strictly from evaporation and how much is coming strictly from transpiration. Condensation. So this is what is occurring when water goes from a vapor to a liquid phase. Okay? One, thing that, one thing to be clear of here is that condensation uh, releases heat. It releases energy. Um, evaporation absorbs heat, it absorbs energy. That's why when you sweat and the sweat evaporates off of you, it cools you because the evaporation, the reaction, that transition, that phase transition requires energy, right? And so it sucks that energy off of your skin and cools you. Condensation going from vapor to liquid, that requires energy. So that actually, that's gonna, um, I'm sorry, that releases energy. So that's gonna, that's gonna heat. Uh, the surrounding environment. Um, precipitation, that is when liquid or solid water from the atmosphere falls to the earth, right? And it doesn't matter whether that's snow, sleet, hail, rain, drizzle, whatever, right? That's precipitation. Um, infiltration, this is what occurs once that water has hit the surface of the, of the, of the ground and goes underground. Um, that's where most of the water that when it rains is actually going. Most of it is actually going to saturate that top layer of dirt, that top layer of soil. Once that's saturated, then you get what's called overland flow, right? Then you get, uh, then you get the, the water flowing off the surface, um, uh, the, where it's not penetrating the surface anymore. And it's sometimes referred to as sheet flow, but that's basically when you get that water that runs off the surface and ends up into a catchment or a river or a stream or what have you in what is called surface runoff. So overland flow and surface runoff are different things. Um, overland flow is when it's not in a channel. It's not in a defined particular like stream, right? Or um, geologic formation where water is conveyed. It just flows right off the surface. It's like water flowing off the side of a hill and then it hits a channel, then it hits a creek, right? Um, <clears throat> and then it's called surface runoff. Um, and all of this is surface water. This is water that is not underground, okay? <laughs> um, as, as sort of the big kind of catch-all category, surface water is just water that's not underground. Groundwater, of course, is water that is underground. Um, typically, it's in an aquifer, Okay, if we're talking about a large body of water, it's usually in an aquifer, which is a body of permeable rock, which can contain or transmit water. It doesn't necessarily have to currently contain or transmit water, but it can, right? Um, so this is uh, essentially just rock that has holes in it, air spaces, um, spots that aren't filled in with, with other matter, right? With other solid matter, whether that's soil, uh, whether that's 
uh, roots or other minerals. It's just space in the dirt, okay? Um, and that's, that's an aquifer, right? The water table, that's basically how high up that groundwater goes, okay? Um, <clears throat> when there's a well or something, like an agriculture that's been dug, um, you really want to know, and especially if your house is on a well, you really want to know what the, what the level of the water table is, because if you don't dig your well deep enough, you're not actually going to drill down far enough to get to the water, right? If the, water t if the height of the water table is 100 feet below the surface, and you drill a well to 75 feet below the surface, you're coming up dry, you're sucking sand, you're not actually going to get any water out of that. Right? You need to be able to get to the top of the water table and go well below it to be able to get enough water out of the ground. <clears throat> so, groundwater has this inter interesting feature where not all of it is fresh, right? Um, and there's this thing called saltwater intrusion, which is uh, important to understand. Um, you can see here that you've got the water table, okay? Um, and you've got the saline groundwater, the saline groundwater, right? So, as you could tell, the seawater here is salt water, and that is um, still infiltrating down. Like, it, water wants to go down. It wants to follow gravity towards the center of the earth, okay? And <clears throat> as such, as all the salt and all the water has accumulated in the oceans, it has permeated that rock. It has permeated the ground beneath it, right? Um, and it goes as deep as it can. Um, <clears throat> there's a transition zone where we go from salt groundwater to fresh groundwater, okay? Um, and as the seawater rises, as we get sea level rise, what happens is the salt water actually, the, the groundwater itself um, actually pushes up. So you get more salt higher up in the water column, right? Um, the other way that this happens is this well sucks up so much fresh water that the salt water starts to move towards it, right? Um, this is another way that you end up in a situation where the salt water begins to intrude into the freshwater aquifer. Um, this is very expensive to fix when this happens. Basically what you have to do is you have to pump fresh water back into the ground, right? And you have to push the salt water back towards the ocean. Um, the Los Angeles Basin dealt with this uh, at one point and they had to spend a tremendous amount of money pumping fresh water underground to basically push the ocean water or the salt water that's underground back towards the ocean. Um, so that their wells could continue to pull out fresh water. This is another way in which you can see that, right? Um, as the sea level comes up in the, in the, the central the center panel, um, that salt water is going to be pushed higher up, okay? Um, and if you overdraw that well, if you take out too much fresh water, the salt water will come in, right? The other thing, one thing that this doesn't show is that as the sea level rises, this fresh water here, it's not just gonna like go away. It's gonna be pushed up through the surface of the earth and flood. So there are areas that are low enough in the Bay Area, have low enough elevation, that as the sea water, as the, as the, as the sea level rises, that salt water that's underground is gonna push the fresh water that's already towards or very near the surface past that level of the surface and you're going to get flooding um, in these neighborhoods. So continuing with the water cycle, uh, we need to understand that water on land flows in these units called watersheds. Um, what you're looking at right here is the one that I work in uh, most uh, for my job, which is the Laguna de Santa Rosa watershed sometimes called the Mark, the Mark West Creek watershed um, by the uninitiated. <laughs> um, basically, what this shows is an area of land that drains all water that falls within it to a single point. There is a single outlet, right? So it's an area that drains to a single point, 
That is the definition of a watershed. So all this stream network here is all leading to this point where the Laguna de Santa Rosa meets the Russian River. Okay. A reservoir. A reservoir is a body of water that is relatively stable through time, and it can be both surface or groundwater. Okay. So what you're looking at here is a map of Annadale State Park, Spring Lake, which is a county park, and Howarth Park, which is a city park. All three of these reservoirs are bodies of water that are stable through time, okay? For the most part. Sometimes they draw one down, but um, basically these persist through time. Um, Lake Osanjo has a dam, Spring Lake has several dams, and Lake Ralphine has a dam, okay? Um, <clears throat> so these are reservoirs that are created by dams. Now, a reservoir doesn't have to be created by dams. It can just be a lake, and like I said, it can be underground, right? But <clears throat> ultimately, um, these three, again, are created by dams, and a dam is just a structure that holds water back. So <clears throat> it is incorrect to say something like, the dam holds a 1,000 gallons of water. No, the reservoir holds a 1,000 gallons of water. The dam is the thing that just keeps that water from going anywhere, okay? A reservoir is the thing that has the water in it. A dam does not have any water in it. If you have water in your dam, your dam is about to fail, and everybody downstream of it is screwed, right? Um, a wetland, oh, this is just a picture of uh, the Lake Il Sanjo Dam, okay? Um, it has an emergency spillway, which you can also, well, you can't see it in this picture, but it's in the frame of this photograph. Um, <clears throat> and so this dam, this is a flood control project. It regulates um, the flow of water off of a large portion of Annadale State Park and prevents um, flooding downstream <clears throat> and uh, ensures that Spring Lake itself doesn't overtop sometimes. And a wetland is an area that is partially submerged or wet for much or all of the year. So a wetland, what, is, what does it look like exactly? Um, it doesn't have to be big, right? Like when I was talking about vernal pools, those are, those are wetlands. Those are areas where water accumulates um, that doesn't necessarily have to drain, have a surface route to drain. It can, it can just infiltrate into the ground. Um, a wetland can be as small, like a vernal pool can be as small as, you know, a few feet in diameter. Um, there are some wetlands that uh, are acres that are huge, right? Really, it just needs to fit this definition, that it's partially submerged or wet for much or all of the year. Wetland delineation is how you say where the wetland starts and stops. If you know how to do this, you can get a job. I'll repeat that. If you know how to do wetland delineation, you can get a job. And it won't be a shitty job. You can get a job with contractors, with consulting firms, with governments. You can get a job in academia <laughs> if you know how to do wetland delineation okay, well enough. Um, basically, this is, again, where the water or, sorry, where the wetland starts or stops, or is it even a wetland? There are a lot of different legal definitions of this term. The Clean Water Act, the Federal Act, which we'll talk about in a little bit, uses a few definitions. California uses some other definitions. But basically, there's a three-part test. Is water present for at least part of the year, like on the surface? Can you see it? Is it ponding? Is there water there? Do the plants that grow there like water? Are they hydrophilic? Right? Are they the kind of plants that can handle inundation? Right? That can handle being at least partially underwater or that can survive in totally saturated soils? And are those soils hydric? Which is to say, because of the fact that water has filled all the pore space in the soil, there's no oxygen. Right? There's no gaseous oxygen in that soil, which normally in the pore space and the holes in the, in the dirt would be filled with air. Right? And the little critters and the plants and everything would normally have access to that oxygen. Is that soil now anoxic? 
and you can do tests on the soil over time, it starts to develop a particular kind of chemical profile, um, and, you, and you do some soil tests, and, and you can determine whether or not the soil is, is hydric. So where, when we're talking about precipitation, where does all that water end up going? Um, well, a lot of it ends up in forests. A tremendous amount ends up in forests, right? And that water ends up largely being evaporated back off, okay? A lot of it also ends up in other natural systems, like grasslands in particular, okay? And that, again, is evaporated off largely some of it ends up as surface water, right, which is that broad category of, of water that is not groundwater, okay, um, and then some of it goes into groundwater recharge. A smaller portion goes into cropland, so a vast amount of precipitation occurs that does not actually make it to crops, right. Um, some grasslands end up being food because cows and other grazers eat those grasses. Um, but by and large, uh, the vast majority of precipitation does not go to uh, feeding human beings. Notice what's missing off of this is the precipitation that falls over the ocean. Um, this is total precipitation on land. The vast majority of precipitation occurs over the ocean. Um, Water exists in the atmosphere for a matter of days or weeks before it's precipitated out again. The largest source of water for the atmosphere is the ocean, and 70% of the Earth's surface is the ocean. So most of the water cycle is actually happening over the ocean. You're just getting continuous cycles of evaporation, condensation, and precipitation occurring over the ocean. Um, obviously then it will come to land, and then that's the water cycle that we're most familiar with where we end up with infiltration and, and surface runoff and so forth. Human beings use a lot of water. Um, <clears throat> what do we use it for? Okay, uh, We use it, in the United States at least, primarily for two things. Generating electricity and irrigating crops. Okay, Irrigating food. The thing about the thermoelectric power, the thing about generating electricity, is that generally speaking, what you're doing is you're boiling water, right? You're generating steam, and that's spinning a turbine, and that generates electricity. Um, <clears throat> the boiling of the water is not where we use, is, 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 is actually a closed system, right? Because then it's recondensed and then boiled again, and recondensed and boiled again. It's that recondensing part that requires water to be withdrawn from the environment in large quantities because that's the water that is used to cool the steam, right? Um, the steam is fed into these tiny narrow pipes and those pipes are, are, um, exist in a body of water and that water is drawn in from a river usually or the ocean in rare cases, right? And because of the fact that that steam is now in contact with metal that is in contact with that cool water, that steam condenses back down, okay? Um, <clears throat> and so it can be boiled again. So that's that what we call once-through cooling, okay? Um, <clears throat> agricultural irrigation is the other big piece, and that's consumptive, right? So instead of just being withdrawn and then put back into the environment, that water doesn't go back to the environment, for the most part, okay? Um, some of it infiltrates into the ground. If you're using flood irrigation, some of it will run off the field. Some of it will become what's called tailwater and go back into the stream. But for the most part, anywhere from 50 to 95% of the water that's taken out for irrigation is turned into transpiration, right? The plants use it, okay, uh, as they grow. Um, about 40% of the groundwater that's used in California is used to grow crops. Um, <clears throat> municipal and industrial. So this is the next, this is the next category. Um, it's called public supply. 
or self-supplied industrial, right? Um, and that's all the other things that we do. So, you know, if you're um, <clears throat> in manufacturing, right, you're going to use a lot of water to clean parts and clean products, um, to cool things. Um, if you're in uh, <clears throat> a city, you're going to be drinking <laughs> water. You're going to be using it in your home. Um, most of the public supply also in the Western United States is going to go to irrigate your lawn or your landscaping, right? Um, let me jump ahead to that, actually. Uh, this is residential consumptive use. So this is the use that occurs uh, inside this diagram, right? A quarter in your toilet and then the rest. <laughs> Um, so getting a low flow toilet is actually important because it's the largest user of water uh, in your in your house or in your apartment. Um, the next is the shower and your faucet. They're pretty much tied, your clothes washer, okay? Um, and some other uses like literally just for drinking or what have you. Um, basically what, what this is to say is that about half of the water that you use is gonna, you know, if you're in an apartment, you're going to actually use a lot less water because you're not going to be the person responsible, probably, hopefully, for irrigating the lawns, okay? And you're going to have a smaller square footage uh, of lawn than somebody who's got a, a larger suburban yard or something like that. Um, <clears throat> in the Western U.S., again, often greater than half uh, of, of, especially in suburbia, you know, if you exclude the more dense places like Oakland or San Francisco or Los Angeles, and you just look at a very, you know, uh, sprawly type place uh, like we have in Sonoma County, a, a very large percentage of that, uh, that consumptive use is actually going to occur outside, right? Um, and this is because it's hot here in the summer and it doesn't rain. Like in the east, they don't need to water their lawns that much, right? They don't need to run their sprinklers the way we do because it rains a lot, um, even in the summer. The rest of the water that you use basically goes to cleaning stuff. You in the shower, like washing your poop down the toilet, your clothes, right, your dishes, like that's largely what water is used for in your home is cleaning things, right, or keeping things clean, sanitary. Um, leaks are very expensive to find uh, and they're important, but a lot of water utilities basically have stopped trying to look for them just because the technology that's required to detect a leak, again, is very expensive. Um, and oftentimes it's not their problem, right? Because if, if it's leaking, then you're paying for the water that you're not using. And they don't mind that because they've sent you the water and however much, you know, is, is they send you, you pay for that. As long as the leak occurs on your side of the meter, <laughs> they don't really care um, because that means that they're, you're paying for it. Increasingly, they've started to care because they realize that it's gonna get really expensive to replace that 12%. Like this is a 12% that they can't use. It's gone, it's wasted. So that if they wanna, you know, if the population of the city wants to grow another 10 to 12%, for example, they would need to find another 10 to 12% of water supply, right? If they can just fix the leaks, they don't have to find that extra water supply. So as cities become pressured, by limited water supplies, they're starting to care more about conservation, about using less water per person. So there are other supplies of water resources besides just surface water and groundwater, right, um, that you should know about that, occur, that, that um, is potentially coming to a city near you. Um, the first is desalination, um, which is basically this diagram here on the right. Reverse osmosis is the most common process right now. It's also incredibly expensive um, and, and requires a lot of energy. But basically, you push really hard on a lot of salt water and uh, it hits this membrane which has tiny, tiny, tiny holes in it, right? And all that can make it through is the water. Over time, the membrane needs to be replaced and cleaned because it gets clogged with the contaminants, with the salt and whatever else. But you get salt, you get pure water out the other end. Okay. Um, again, very expensive. The same is true of potable reuse for the most part. 
Um, you do end up having to use reverse osmosis, and then you also end up using uh, ultraviolet light. Basically, you're taking the water that comes out of your wastewater treatment plant um, and turning it into stuff you can drink, theoretically. Um, this is largely considered safe when it's done properly, uh, especially if you pump that water underground, let it mix with an existing aquifer, and then pull it back out. Um, or put it in another surface water reservoir and then pull it back out. But typically putting it underground is more accepted by the public um, as opposed to um, putting in a surface reservoir. This, some, this has sometimes been called a toilet to tap, right? Um, by those who oppose it and those who support it often call it showers to flowers because you don't necessarily have to drink this stuff. There's this thing called purple pipe infrastructure uh, where this highly treated, treated uh, wastewater, um, even if it doesn't become potable, even if it's not drinkable, you can use it to irrigate, right? So why would you put drinking water on your lawn when you can just put this stuff on your lawn? It's not up to drinking water standards, but the plants don't need drinking water quality, right? So <clears throat> you, can, you can look at it this way um, as another way of being more efficient with the limited water supplies that we have. So in California, one of the things that used to limit our economy was a limited supply of water. Um, <clears throat> over time, this has changed, right? We built our very large infrastructure projects, which I'll talk about in a bit, and essentially we've decoupled our economic and population growth from the need to find new water supplies, okay? We've become much more efficient with our use of the water that we do have, right? Um, <clears throat> and you can think of this as an IPAT equation, right? We talked about IPAT earlier in the course, impact equals population times affluence times technology. We have a growing population. That population is getting richer, theoretically at least. Um, our per capita income, or I should just say our GDP per capita is going up. Um, our economy is getting larger. And so, basically, what we're left with is the need to implement technology that reduces our use of water per person and per dollar of GDP. Um, and we've done that. Uh, we've done that basically by investing in, in indoor conservation, right? So, um, all those high-efficiency washing machines, high efficiency dishwashers, high efficiency toilets, um, you know, installing the 2.5 gallon per minute shower head instead of the 8 gallon per minute shower head, um, installing the half gallon a minute sink uh, nozzle instead of the 2 gallon a minute sink nozzle, and so forth. Um, ripping out lawns and replacing them with xeriscaped landscapes, uh, native plants and flowers and trees and stuff that don't need summer water and irrigation. These are all things that have happened in cities uh, to reduce our reliance uh, on finding new water supplies. So let's talk a little bit specifically about water in California. Um, what you can see here is a map of precipitation uh, where it is where it most mostly occurs, and you can see that it occurs mostly in uh, the north, uh, the northern portion of the state. So this is, this is what we sort of call the population precipitation mismatch or population precipitation problem, which is <clears throat> that 80% or so of the surface water in the state occurs in the northern part of the state. 80% of the population occurs in the southern part of the state. Okay, um, <clears throat> So how do we get the water from the northern part of the state to the southern part of the state? Um, how did the southern part of the state even become so populated given that most of it is a desert? Why isn't the northern part of the state the most populated given that that's where the water supplies are? That is a very long, that would require, that's a whole class, okay? Um, there are books after, there are many, many books written about that question. Uh, but what it comes down to is Los Angeles uh, was a very large city, um, that has decided uh, with very powerful backing um, to become the, uh, the, the largest city 
in the Western United States. Um, and it did so uh, basically by um, being very clever about acquiring water resources. Um, and I'll show you some um, I'll show you some some maps that'll illustrate this. Uh, basically, this was about creating a power center in the Western United States um, that would be able to possess the industry um, to, uh, to 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 sort of hold the western portion of uh, this continent for the United States um, and make it a, a Pacific power. Right, developing the West Coast was very important for um, strategic reasons. Uh, and getting water to Los Angeles uh, facilitated that process. Um, there's this phenomenon in California where there is no normal water year. Like, there is no normal year in California. California has an incredibly variable precipitation history um, where some years are incredibly dry and some years are incredibly wet, and for the most part, there is almost no year that is actually average or actually normal, okay? Um, so yes, we just got through one of the most extreme droughts in California history, but depending on, <laughs> on how far back you go, we would expect to have a drought like that. Like a drought like that is not out of the normal for what you can expect in the Western United States or in California. Um, if it occurs again in the next couple decades or even the next century, then that would be abnormal, right? Um, <clears throat> but those kinds of droughts have occurred and will continue to occur even without climate change, just because of the variability of precipitation that exists in California. This gives you another uh, diagram, sort of giving an indication of you know where the water is and then the net water use. And as you can see, water uh, availability is only higher in the northern part of the state uh, than water use. Water use is higher in the southern part of the state than water availability. Um, and they've included environmental here. And what environmental means is this is flow that is not diverted and used either for urban or agricultural purposes. And you can see that here in the South Coast region, right, um, Los Angeles and so forth and San Diego, Lots of urban use, not a lot of agriculture, okay? Here in the Central Valley, you've got a lot of agricultural use and not as much urban use, right? Um, and then the North Coast here, the region that we live in, um, in most of Sonoma County, um, Petaluma is actually in the, um, in the SF Bay Area region, which has mostly urban use. Um, the North Coast has... Um, a lot of environmental water, which is to say water that is not currently diverted and used for urban uh, uses or agricultural uses. The major river is the Klamath River, which I'll show you in a second. So the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta is the focal point or one of the most important pieces of the water story in California. You can see that in the 1850s, this is where the Sacramento River from the north and the San Joaquin River from the south meet. It's really an estuary because this whole sort of thing, this complex, um, is where salt water and fresh water meet. Um, you can see that tidal wetland was an expansive part of the landscape here in the Bay Area and in the Delta um, in the 1850s. As this, as this, after the Spanish arrived and then later the Americans, um, <clears throat> this became much more urbanized. A lot of, you can see a lot of the canals that were built. Um, here's the Yolo Bypass uh, showing up in, in some of the, the four bays and the reservoirs that were being developed on the, on the, on the San Joaquin River. And then finally, uh, by the 1990s, there's basically no tidal wetland left, all of it being urbanized. Um, <clears throat> and this, of course, having multiple effects, not just on um, ecosystems, but also on hydrology. Right, um, urban areas uh, have lots of impervious surface, so the runoff is very rapid. Right, there's very little infiltration. Um, the delta receives about seventy percent of the surface flows from Calif uh, in in California. So, of all the surface flow that this state has, seventy percent of it moves into the delta. Okay, 
It's an incredibly important um, piece of our water picture. Um, it drains 45% of the state's land area. Two-thirds of the state's residents drink water that comes from the Delta, right? So basically Southern California. This is where Los Angeles gets its water. This and the Colorado River. And one-third of agricultural land is irrigated by Delta water. Okay? Um, this is what the surface flow situation looks like. You can see how much of it makes it to the Delta, right? The Sacramento River is our state's most important river when it comes to total volume. The Klamath River is the large one up at the top. And of course, the Colorado is sitting here on the state line. So how did Los Angeles get so big? Here are all the pipes, okay? There's the Colorado River Aqueduct, which uh, moves, moves water into LA and to San Diego, but primarily LA. There's the Los Angeles Aqueduct, which uh, almost destroyed Mono Lake and did destroy Owens Valley and Owens Lake. Um, <clears throat> there is then the state water project and the federal water project. The federal water project is called the Central Valley Project, um, and it is primarily for agriculture, uh, whereas the state water project is primarily for Los Angeles um, and, to a lesser extent, San Diego. Um, this is, and, and to a, an even lesser extent, um, San Jose. Um, <clears throat> this is how we get all the water <laughs> that we need from the north to the south, okay? Um, and, and, and this MAF number here is million acre feet. An acre foot is just this weird measure of water that's used in the western United States, which is um, one acre covered with a foot of water. So it's a volumetric measure. And oftentimes the way that this is summarized is by saying, this is a football field flooded with a foot of water. That's about an acre foot. So there's about 200 million acre feet a year of precipitation. About 100 million acre feet a year is consumed. And one, I'm sorry, 10 to 20 million acre feet a year ultimately are diverted through these projects. So this is a, tr this is a very large percentage of all the water that is used in, um, in California. To give you a sense of, again, where this water goes, in the Western United States, about 80% of all the water that is consumptively used by people is used in agriculture. About 20% is used in cities. So this is one of the reasons that when urbanites are told to conserve and use less water, oftentimes, you know, take shorter showers and so on and so forth, oftentimes there's a resentment because the real answer, if you're looking at percentage, is to squeeze agriculture, is to say, they need to become more efficient in ag because a 2% improvement in, in irrigated agriculture would translate to like a 10% improvement in urban water use, right? It'd be like five times the size in terms of volume. So if you're looking for volumetric savings in water, you need to focus on irrigated agriculture. Um, the rest of the water in the state goes to environmental purposes, so in-stream flows that are required for different species, wild and scenic rivers that are required by law um, to keep those rivers wild and scenic, different wetlands, and then of course required delta outflows because of, again the endangered species that exist in the delta require certain surface waters, um, I'm sorry, certain freshwater uh, contributions in order to survive. All right, so that's water resources. Let's take a five minute break and then I'll cover water pollution until 9.30.
Check, check, check. Testing, testing. Okay. Whoop. That got a little high. Check, 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 check. All right. More Taos Pueblo. Cool stuff. Uh, all right. So I just responded to several emails uh, letting people know that I received their answers to the prompt. Um, okay, great. Awesome. Thank you, Hector. Thank you for responding to the... The microphone check. All right, so uh, before we roll on, um, or as I roll on, just want to make sure uh, another, this isn't necessarily, this isn't necessarily, well, yeah. Please uh, either respond in the chat or uh, write me an email and let me know what, uh, what you think is the largest consumer of water in the United States. What, is, what sector is the largest consumer of water in the United States? Hello, Anahi. Uh, and while you're doing that, I'm going to roll on through water pollution. So again, disclaimer, this is just me talking, not as an employee of the state. Um, Teddy Roosevelt, president from 1908 to 19... No, I think it was 1904 to 1908. Yes, 1904 to 1908. Um, <clears throat> although, I guess, well, anyway. Uh, indicated, uh, had this quote. said, civilized people ought to know how to dispose of their sewage in some other way than putting it in their drinking water. Yes, we should. <laughs> Um, and yet, for a very long time, that is exactly what we did. Untreated. Um, raw sewage into the drinking water. Um, <clears throat> yes, all of you saying agriculture are correct. Um, not just in California, but in the United States. In California, it's, uh, it's about 80% of the water that's consumed. Um, and then throughout the entire United States, it's between 30 and 40 percent of all the water that is withdrawn from uh, from the river. Very nice. All right. So water pollution. There's a lot of ways that pollution can get into the water. Um, but I guess before we can talk about that, there's um, a couple things to understand about pollution. Pollution is either point source or non-point source. This is true of air pollution and water pollution. With respect to water pollution, basically this is delivered to a water body through the end of a pipe or identifiable point. Okay, um, And so this means that it's coming from a wastewater treatment plant. So this is a wastewater treatment plant is something that deals with the stuff that goes down the drain or the toilet or, you know, uh, from out the end of your dishwasher or something in your house. Okay, that, it, it deals with that kind of waste. Um, restaurants and so forth. It deals with stuff that's generated from inside. Um, there are basically no treatment uh, facilities for stormwater, for water that flows off your roof and into your yard or off your driveway and into the street and so forth. Those drains, those storm drains, nothing is treated. That is not treated at all. Um, that goes straight into the creek. Um, and there was an amendment to the Clean Water Act that made those also considered point source discharges, um, even though it's a very diffuse source overall. Um, other large point sources are from factories, okay? Um, <clears throat> all kinds of refineries, uh, facilities that manufacture, um, you know, these are, these are places that use a lot of water and generate a lot of wastes that they um, have found throughout history. Um, it's most convenient to dispose of them by, uh, by discharging them into, into rivers and streams, particularly in the eastern United States. Non-point source pollution has a diffuse source and is delivered to a water body through multiple non-discrete methods. Okay? Um, so this, for the most part, means agriculture. Okay? Um, this is ag runoff that you're seeing right now. Uh, this is carrying with it pesticides, herbicides, 
um, sediment, right? It's carrying, um, <clears throat> it's carrying dirt and grit and so forth. Um, it's also probably carrying with it fertilizer. Um, it's carrying with it nitrogen and phosphorus, okay? Um, stormwater runoff is, is the definition is overland flow that picks up pollutants and causes erosion as it goes. So you're looking at stormwater runoff right now um, in this picture. Uh, this is, and it's going to start to form gullies, and eventually this is going to channelize, and it's going to ruin this guy's farmland. <laughs> um, so he better take care of it, uh, otherwise he's going to lose his soil. There's another mechanism um, called atmospheric deposition. So this is actually how most mercury gets into California lakes, uh, is from uh, coal-fired power plants that uh, have a lot of mercury in the um, the... the the pollution coming off those power plants. Um, <clears throat> and uh, sorry, I'm just looking at some of the comments. Um, <clears throat> and the, um, the stuff that's in the atmosphere rains out, right? When it rains, it catches the stuff in the atmosphere and that ends up uh, in our lakes, uh, in our rivers and streams. So that's actually how most of the mercury in California ends up in the lakes and the rivers and streams is, is, is uh, air pollution from China. Um, and then of course, agricultural runoff. So even if it's delivered by a pipe, it's still considered non-point source. And this is distinct from stormwater where uh, urban stormwater in particular, where uh, the pollution that is conveyed, even though it is discharged at a single point in the, from a pipe, right? It's diffuse and with, with urban stormwater, that's considered a point source. In agriculture, even if it's just, you know, comes out of a pipe, it's considered non-point source. And so this is one of those, those holes in regulation because the Clean Water Act doesn't regulate non-point source water. So non-point source pollution of, of our water bodies is not regulated by the Clean Water Act. In order for the Clean Water Act, the federal Clean Water Act, to regulate water pollution, it's got to be a point source. So in this picture... The pipe on the right could be coming from a farm, and the pipe on the left could be coming from a factory. They might both be coming from a single point. They might, tech, they might actually be point sources, but by the law, the one that's coming from a farm on the right is not considered a point source and is not regulated. The one on the left that is coming from a factory is a point source and is regulated. One of the major functions of the Clean Water Act, which was passed in 1972, uh, was to regulate wastewater and waste and to, and to promote wastewater treatment, right? Basically, it goes back to Teddy Roosevelt saying, we shouldn't just put raw shit in the river, right? It's just a bad idea. People are going to get sick, right? This is how polio spreads. This is how all kinds of terrible diseases get spread is by human beings putting poop in water that people downstream are going to try to fish out of, play in, or drink from, right? So <clears throat> there's a mechanism, right? There's a lot of, um, basically, there's, there's, and I'll show you this process in just a second in a diagram. There are ways in which we can treat the water that goes down our drains, right? First, you have to get the primary treatment, which is getting out big solids like trash and grit and sludge, which is a nice way of saying poop. The secondary way is to oxidize the smaller solids and what's left of the sludge and other carbon-based molecules. So we use bacteria to eat that stuff, right? They consume it. They go through cellular respiration, right? They oxidize it, and then they emit CO2. Tertiary treatment, which is the next level up, which is not, not usually required by law, is the removal of other major, major chemical contaminants like phosphorus and nitrogen, and other pharmaceuticals, um, if they in pharmaceuticals if they can, right? Um, in quaternary or just potable reuse, this removes all contaminants to drinkable levels. Um, so that's those are the three. I'm sorry, the four major levels of wastewater treatment. Um, tertiary is good enough to irrigate with. It's good enough to use outside, um, and then you know potable reuse is good enough to uh, to drink straight away. Um, secondary is good enough to discharge. You basically have to do secondary treatment. If you don't do secondary treatment, um, you're either breaking the law or you've gotten an exemption from the Clean Water Act. So here's some pollution hotspots in California. Um, 
I'm not going to read all this to you, but it, it suffices to say that the kinds of challenges that we face basically boil down to um, agriculture and industry. <laughs> um, so uh, from agriculture, we have nutrients, we have other industrial chemicals. Um, from concentrated animal feeding operations, we have both nutrients and pathogens, bacteria and so forth. Um, from everything, both agriculture and cities, we have sediment challenges. Um, and from cities, we also have bacteria and viruses. We have pathogenic challenges. Oil and grease is also a major problem uh, coming from cities. Heavy metals, that's in metals generally. That's going to come also from, um, from agriculture and cities. So industry is going is to produce metals like copper and mercury, but also agriculture is going to use metals um, like copper, especially um, as, uh, <clears throat> as pesticides, right? Um, so a lot of different kinds of contaminants are going to end up uh, in, in the water. Um, and this other one down here, temperature, basically uh, the Clean Water Act does regulate the temperature of streams. So if basically there's not enough shade um, and the temperature gets too high, then certain plants and certain animals can't survive in that water. Water has this peculiar quality where when it's warmer, it holds less stuff. So gases have a harder time dissolving into warm water than cold water. So if you rely on oxygen being dissolved in the water and the water gets too hot, you're not going to have enough oxygen, right? Um, and a lot of these plants, or I'm sorry, a lot of these fish, salmon in particular, require cold water in order to even just survive, right? Um, and so particularly in the north coast here, where temperature and sediment are major challenges, um, <clears throat> salmon are, are really uh, endangered and literally endangered. I'm not going to go into this. This is more for reference. Um, it's a it's a it's a well understood uh, process for treating wastewater. Um, you can even get a tour if you want. You literally can just call these people up, say, "I want to tour your facility," and oftentimes. Uh, they'll ask you to get a group together and they'll do it. So there's a lot of ways to tell that water is polluted. You know, you can look at it. Does it look cloudy? Okay. Does it have a lot of like gross stuff growing in it? Um, does it smell right? Many chemicals, especially sulfur and ammonia can be detected by a person. Um, does it smell like decaying matter? Right. Does it smell of death? Okay. Uh, you can do laboratory tests to determine whether or not uh, the water is polluted. Um, this is some of the most common stuff that's, that's done by my office, um, where we test for bacteria, nitrogen, phosphorus, various metals, dissolved oxygen, pH, temperature, and so forth. Um, and we do that either in the field with certain uh, field instruments, or we do it in the lab by taking a sample um, and running it through some chemistry or some biology. And then finally, biological assessment. This is, a, this is often the cheapest, um, and it's often um, the most effective because rather than just looking at the chemistry and asking, would this support living things? Would this be acceptable for habitat? Um, you can just look at the habitat, and so you don't have to sort of make that jump from the water quality to the habitat. You just know what kinds of animals can survive in it. So this is the kind of uh, survey that you would do. It's called a macroinvertebrate survey, and you basically just go, these are the large animals without spines. So these are the insects and the worms and the clams and things like that um, <clears throat> that we can see with our eyes. Uh, and each one of these has different sensitivities. So some of them can survive in cold, uh, colder water and others prefer warmer water. Some of them require a very specific range of pH. Some of them do very well um, under very intense pollution conditions. There are some of these bugs and critters that are just, they, they just go gangbusters in really crappy water. Um, and then some of them are incredibly sensitive and, and are only going to be found in really high quality water. So you go out there, you get some biologists, and you, um, 
there are different methods for doing this, but you basically identify what critters live where. Um, and this is where the biological, this is where biodiversity comes in, right? Because we need to know not only how many species there are, but we need to know their relative abundance, okay? Um, and when we do that, we can identify basically how good or bad the water quality of a given habitat is. So the person who said this uh, might surprise you. The great question of the 70s is, shall we surrender to our surroundings or shall we make our peace with nature and begin to make reparations for the damage we have done to our air, to our land, and to our water? The person who said this was the first Californian to be president, Richard Milhouse Nixon. Tricky dick. There he is. Um, <laughs> he's, he, was, uh, he also signed the Endangered Species Act. Um, the Clean Water Act, which he signed, was motivated in part by the Cuyahoga River Fire of 1969. And this is kind of a historical anachronism. This, this got blown way out of proportion. Um, this picture, which, you know, uh, Time Magazine used as its picture of this Cuyahoga River Fire of 1969, was actually a 1952 fire. And it was really this Time Magazine article that was very sensationalist that got the whole country up in arms and saying, this is a serious problem. We have to deal with this. Congress, you have to fix this. Our rivers, our stream, everything, like we have, our water is crap. In many cases, literally, it's sewer. It's just nasty, okay? It, it was so nasty here and, and polluted with petrochemicals that it caught on fire, okay? Um, but of course, this had happened a half dozen or so, a dozen times in its history. Um, the Cuyahoga River today is, is much cleaner. Uh, the Clean Water Act worked. But let me just say that if you understand the Clean Water Act, you can get a job, even if you're not a lawyer, okay? The Clean Water Act applies to waters of the United States. There are arguments about what a water of the United States is. We will talk briefly about this. It applies to point sources, not technically to non-point sources, but in reality, some non-point sources, specifically urban stormwater. The goal of the Clean Water Act is to create fishable, swimmable waters right? Waters that you can fish in, that you can eat from, and that you can swim in, that are clean enough for you to, to come in direct contact with. Um, and the elimination of point source discharges by 1985, which has utterly failed and they don't take it seriously. Um, this, it's part of the law, but they just don't take it seriously. Today, uh, only about 60% of the waters in the United States are actually safe to fish and swim in. So, um, like the Endangered Species Act, this has stopped things from getting worse, but it hasn't necessarily made things better. This is uh, Emperor Justinian, and this guy is important because uh, our water law is based in large part on his water law. Um, there are a few slides here that I'm going to go th that I'm not actually going to go through for time purposes, but basically, the idea here is that no individual has a right to deprive another individual of clean air, clean water, access to the ocean, access to the water, uh, and the shores of the ocean, or the shores of, of rivers and streams. Um, essentially, these things are common to mankind, right? Um, and uh, as a result, um, it's illegal to defile those waters or to deny people access to those waters for purposes, um, for legitimate purposes. So I'm going to skip these. Um, and just give you back to the legal basis, which is that people have a private right to use flowing waters of the United States, but not own the waters of the United States. Um, and what is a water of the United States? That is a very complicated, complicated question. The lawyers have talked a lot about it. There are a couple slides here that we'll all get into. Why is that happening? Okay, good. Still working. Um, <laughs> basically... You can't have private ownership because that wouldn't allow for the maximum simultaneous utilization of that water by multiple parties. And that would, de that would, that would degrade the ability of the economy to grow, right? Um, so water has to be maintained in a condition that it can be used for purposes besides the one that you're using it for.
The basic design of the Clean Water Act is that there are these things called designated uses or in California beneficial uses. Those uses are the things that that water body can, has, or could support, right? Um, there are things like fishing. There are things like swimming. There are also things like uh, fish habitat, fish spawning. There are things like basic uh, recreation like boating. There are things like uh, shellfish harvesting. Um, there are things like indigenous use, uh, ceremonial use, right? Um, <clears throat> these uses are defined uh, in law, in policy. Um, they are linked to these things called water quality criteria, which basically say, in order for you to be able to swim in this water, it can't have above X amount of bacteria in it. It can't be of a pH outside this range. For fish to be able to reproduce in this water, the temperature has to be between this and this other thing, and the dissolved oxygen level has to be in this range, and you can't have this much of copper in it, and so on and so forth, right? So the, the pollutant criteria, the water quality criteria, are linked to the uses. And then there are these sets of policies that basically say you're not allowed to degrade water to the point where a use isn't attainable anymore. And if a water isn't attaining a use that it could attain, you need to go out and fix it. You need to go out and, and implement some policies that make sure that that water body can actually do the things that you want it to do, like support fish or something like that. That's the basic design of the Clean Water Act. All right? Where does it apply? Waters of the United States. Again, an entire course in law school. Okay? <laughs> water law. I took it. It was a whole semester, 15 weeks of nothing but water law. It was great. Um, it applies, why is that happening? It applies to navigable waters, tributaries of navigable waters, and wetlands that are adjacent to navigable waters, I don't like that at all, um, <clears throat> with a surface connection, right? Everything else gets argued about in court. Those three things are clear and indisputed, indisputable, right? Everything else is argued in court and has been since Ronald Reagan administration issued their rules on what counted as waters of the United States. This has basically become, and you can look at these articles that are very interesting about what counts as the waters of the United States in practice and in law. It, it differs. Shocking. Um, this is what it looked like after a 2008 court decision. Those things that are colored in, that counted as waters of the United States. Right? The Obama administration extended it, and there are certain things... I, that's not good. There are certain things that count, right? Um, and certain things that don't, okay? Um, so just looking back and forth, you can see that essentially the floodplain, ephemeral streams, intermittent streams, these things count under the Obama administration. Under the Trump administration... Those things do not count at all, not even in a case-by-case -case basis. Um, this is the rule that the Trump administration has proposed. Um, this, is a, this is a very strong deviation from what George H.W. Bush, George W. Bush, Ronald Reagan had wanted, um, had indicated was appropriate. Um, because an administration has the ability to rewrite these rules whenever they want. Um, and they didn't. The Trump administration has come out with this, which of course is going to end up in court. Um, and will probably be very vigorously challenged. The reason for that is that in the western United States, almost all of our streams are intermittent. Or ephemeral. That is to say, they don't flow year-round. And if it doesn't flow year-round under the Trump administration rule... It's not a waters of the United States. And so essentially the Clean Water Act would not apply to anything in orange here. Um, and that's a, a, a major pollution problem. That's a major public health problem. There's a lot of people that are going to get sick um, if, if, if this goes into effect. To say nothing of the plants and animals. This is a diagram that gives you a sense of how that works. In... in 
in California. In California, everything's a water. <laughs> a waters of the state. We have our own water law, uh, Clean Water Act, that uh, basically supersedes the federal law because the federal law is a floor, not a ceiling. So our law, although we have to make it work with federal law, it doesn't actually supersede, our law is more restrictive, is more protective, and therefore it's the one that we actually apply. Okay, um, so this rule, this image here, you can just draw a hard line around California um, and identify. This is that's a this is a problem with my monitor. This is a problem with the adapter in my monitor. Um, <clears throat> you can basically apply um, a hard line there, and and, and those those streams are going to be okay in California because we're going to apply state law. Um, <clears throat> urban stormwater, as I said. Uh, is considered point source, um, even though it's a non-point source. That's that's enough of that. Um, these are where those regulated centers are. Eighty percent of the population is covered by point source regulations that your cities and your counties implement to protect streams from stormwater runoff. So you can basically do three things. You can prevent pollution from occurring in the first place, you can reduce the pollution that does occur, and you can s intercept the pollution before it reaches a water body, right? This is what it looks like in Santa Rosa, in English, in Espanol. Basically, don't put anything in here because it's going to go straight to the creek, right? Um, this is what it looks like in practice, where you've got a vegetated swale. This is going to capture all the runoff from that parking lot, before it gets to a creek, right? Um, and so the creek's going to be okay because this grass area is going to take all of the sediment and all of the, the oil from the cars and everything, um, and it's not going to get to the creek. A construction site, similarly, needs to be regulated, so this guy's installing uh, slugs, um, <laughs> wattles, which prevent sediment from reaching a stream. These catchments can actually be important features for a community. They don't have to be ugly. They can be beautiful. They can be um, places for public gathering when coronavirus isn't um, killing people. Agriculture is not regulated. But concentrated animal feeding operations, or animal feeding operations as the industry prefers to refer to them as, are regulated by the Clean Water Act. And that was only in 2008 that this occurred. Um, <clears throat> because all other agriculture is not regulated under the Clean Water Act directly, there need to be other ways to do it. Um, and the ways that have been worked out, I'm going to fix this before next time, the ways that have been worked out basically involve encouraging farmers, in many cases just paying farmers, to implement best management practices, similar to stormwater right? You can reduce the application of pollutants. You can only apply the fertilizer or pesticides in the amounts necessary to, to achieve the desired effect, right? Um, and the federal government spends lots of money through the Natural Resources Conservation Service to promote these kinds of best management practices among farmers. This involves testing the soil, complying with the pesticide labels, and using machines like you see here to precisely administer and apply the pesticides and the fertilizers. You can also control the runoff of pollutants, right? So you can shape and, and, and precise, uh, you can do precision field um, engineering where you contour the land uh, and, and farm with furrows uh, and, and use infiltration ponds to essentially um, reduce the runoff of pollutants uh, and encourage um, <clears throat> crops to, uh, to grow on a level, right? Basically like terracing in, 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 in some ways, um, to prevent the runoff from even occurring. Basically you accumulate the flow, you accumulate the precipitation on the land and it infiltrates and it doesn't run off, right? Um, finally for what water does run off, you implement what are called filter strips and riparian forest buffer or forested riparian buffer where Around a water of the United States or a water body, a tributary, a stream, 
or a wetland or what have you, you plant um, an area with grass, like thick stemmed grass, uh, which is going to capture uh, sediment and slow down the flow of water and, and promote infiltration. And then you leave the bank of the creek alone, uh, or you re intentionally cultivate and plant riparian vegetation, which will also capture um, and infiltrate and ultimately treat um, the, the, the contaminants. Um, how does it treat it? Bacteria. Um, the water infiltrates into the soil and the microbes in the soil uh, actually break down uh, the chemicals of concern, for the most part, some of them. So the summary here of the Clean Water Act is that it's the foundational U.S. water pollution control law. This is the Cuyahoga River, by the way, today. It applies to waters of the United States, whatever that is. It sets a goal of fishable, swimmable waters. It regulates point sources and some non-point sources, such as urban stormwater, but it regulates them as point sources. Okay, It's considered a point source just so that it can be regulated because the act specifically calls out only point sources. Um, and indirectly regulates agriculture by encouraging best management practices. So that's the Clean Water Act as a whole. Um, if you violate this act, uh, I'll give you an example. Our agency just issued a, I think it's a 3.9 or a 4.7. It was in the $4 million range uh, fine for uh, a developer, a resort developer, for violating the Clean Water Act. Basically, they did not implement their best management practices to prevent urban stormwater runoff. Um, and because they failed to do that, our office is going to hit them for four million bucks. Um, <clears throat> they're probably going to negotiate that down, uh, and we're going to insist on uh, them actually implementing the plans, the best management practices. But um, that's uh, that's for that's for you to read in the Press Democrat. <laughs> okay. Or the, the Petaluma paper. Can you tell him from Santa Rosa? Um, coming up. You should have already read chapters 14 and 15. Uh, you're going to turn in exam number two, which I'm going to post as soon as I'm done here next week. Uh, you're going to read, you are going to have to read Hardin's Tragedy of the Commons before next week. I'm sorry about that. This is just the time crunch that we're under. Finalize your group project topic uh, in an email to me by the 14th. Uh, complete assignment three on Hardin's Tragedy of the Commons uh, by 4.14 um, and read chapters 18, 19, and 22 by 4.14. Uh, quick tip, we're going to be covering the Tragedy of the Commons on the 7th. Since you don't have to complete the assignment until the 14th on the Tragedy of the Commons, if you would just want to focus only on exam two um, <clears throat> this next week, you can do that. You won't be as prepared for lecture. You won't get as much out of lecture. Um, and you'll have more to do uh, the next week. But I'm not going to hold you to having to have read Tragedy of the Commons by next week. Um, if, you, if you find you have the time, do it. Otherwise, uh, it's not as big of a deal to me. I definitely need the assignment on the 14th. But that's it. Okay. Um, yeah. That's all there is. So this uh, should be posted on Canvas. The exam is going to be posted on Canvas uh, as soon as I'm done here. And if you have any questions about this lecture, please email me because I'm going to stop the stream um, and I won't be able to read, uh, read your comments um, that you make when the stream closes. So thank you, everyone. Um, looks like we had everyone at least concurrently technically viewing. Their browser window was open. Uh, who knows what else you were you were doing, um, probably trying to survive uh, the corona. So um, in any case, my voice is feeling the wear and tear of not having talked like this for another couple for the past couple weeks. So I'm going to sign off now. Um, thank you all again for participating. And um, I look forward to continuing uh, our, um, our remote learning experience. Adios.